What was your special order? You read it. I thought it was clear. What was it? Bring back Life Form. Priority One. All other priorities were submitted. Well, some of you may have figured out we're not home yet. We're only halfway there. Mother's interrupted the course of a journey. Why? Yeah. She's programmed to do that should certain conditions arise. They have. What? Seems she has intercepted a transmission of unknown origin. She got us up to check it out. Transmission? Out here? Yeah. What kind of a transmission? Acoustical beacon to repeats at intervals of 12 seconds. I saw it. I don't know. Human. Can you see this? Yes, I can. Let's get out of here. Mm. We've got this far. We must go on. Disappeared into one of the cooling ducts. Drive it into the airlock and zap it into outer space. This son of a bitch is huge. I mean, it's like a man. It, it's big. Okay, something. Am I am I clear, Lambert? I want to get the hell out of here. May 25th, 1979, Alien arrived on the big screen and terrified audiences worldwide, making over $104 million, produced on a small budget of just over $8 million. And with simple but effective advertising, it proved a huge financial success for 20th Century Fox. A newcomer, Sigourney Weaver, became a superstar overnight, and Ridley Scott gained huge respect from his peers and critics for his directing talents. Over the years, Alien had come to be regarded as one of the best horror and science fiction films, making many top 10 lists. It started a franchise that has continued to this day, with endless merchandise and video game tie-ins. On home video, it earned over 40 million in rentals, and in the early 90s received a special edition Laserdisc. This included deleted scenes, behind-the-scenes footage, screenplay excerpts and rare production stills. When it came to DVD and eventually Blu-ray, the films were given extensive behind-the-scenes material and documentaries. The Alien Quadrilogy box set would prove one of the best special editions of a movie series. In 2003, to celebrate its upcoming 25th anniversary, a director's cut was released that included a couple of the deleted scenes, including the alien's hive in which it keeps the surviving member Dallas cocooned, and it appears to be turning him into an egg to continue the alien's life cycle. Ridley Scott made minor edits to the theatrical release, making the director's cut about a minute shorter. He still regarded the theatrical cut as his preferred version, but with the re-release they had to offer something new aside from a remastered picture and sound. In the early 70s, Dan O'Bannon had written a dark science fiction comedy film with director John Carpenter. Concept artist Ron Cobb also contributed to its production design, and it was titled Dark Star. It was originally a student film that got out of hand and became too big to be a student project, and it became a feature film. It went down badly with critics and audiences though, the film included an alien which basically looked like a spray painted beach ball and the experience left Dan O'Bannon really wanted to do an alien that looked real. A few years later he began working on a similar story that would focus more on horror. 
Ronald Chusett, meanwhile, was working on an early version of what would eventually become Total Recall after obtaining the rights. Impressed by Darkstar, he contacted O'Bannon, and the two agreed to collaborate on their projects, choosing to work on Dan's film first. Dan O'Bannon had written 29 pages of a script that would become the film's opening scenes up to a point of them landing on the planet. Dan O'Bannon got an offer to work on Jodorowsky's film adaptation of Dune, a project which took him to Paris for six months to help work on the design and visual effects. Though the project ultimately fell through, it introduced him to several artists whose work gave him ideas for his science fiction story, including Chris Frost, H.R. Giger and Mobius. Giger's work had a profound effect on O'Bannon. He had never seen anything that was quite as horrific and at the same time as beautiful as his art. After the Dune project collapsed, Dan O'Bannon returned to LA to live with Ronald Shusett. Shusett suggested that O'Bannon adapt one of his other film ideas about gremlins infiltrating a B-17 bomber during World War II and to set it on a spaceship to form the second half of his script. The working title for the project was Star Beast, but O'Bannon disliked that title, changing it to Alien after noting the number of times the word appeared in the script. Ronald suggested one of the crew members be implanted with an alien embryo that would later burst out of him, feeling that this would be an interesting plot device by which the alien creature would get aboard the ship. During the scripting process, O'Bannon always pictured Giga's design as the alien. With most of the plot completed, Shusett and O'Bannon approached several studios with their initial script, pitching it as Jaws in space. Close to signing with Roger Corman Studio, a friend passed the script on to Gordon Carroll, David Geiler and Morta Hill of Brandywine, who had ties with 20th Century Fox. After signing a deal, Waterhill and Guyla were unsatisfied and made numerous rewrites and revisions to the script, causing tension with O'Bannon and Shusett, since Gill and Guyla had very little experience with science fiction. Dan worried that they would change enough in an attempt to take his name off the script, claiming it as their own. However, Walter and David did add some substantial elements to the story, including the android character Ash. Walter and David drafted eight different versions of the script, exploiting the Ash subplot whilst naturalising the dialogue and trimming some sequences set on the alien planetoid. Despite this, 20th Century Fox were not confident about financing a science fiction film, but after the success of Star Wars in 1977, the studio's interest in the genre surprisingly increased. Gordon Carroll said when Star Wars came out, and was the extraordinary hit that it was, suddenly science fiction became the hot genre. O'Bannon recalled that they wanted to follow through on Star Wars, and they wanted to follow through fast, and the only spaceship script they had sitting on their desk was Alien. As a result, Alien was greenlit, with an initial budget of $4.2 million. Initially, there were difficulties in finding a director. O'Bannon, although originally wanting to direct Alien, he was passed up by 20th Century Fox for Walter Hill. Hill declined due to the required level of visual effects and not having the patience for them. Many other big name directors were considered, but O'Bannon, Shusett and the Brandywine team wanted a director that would push for an A-grade film, instead of treating it as a B-monster movie. All had been impressed by Ridley Scott's work on The Duelists from 1977, and they had made an offer to him to direct Alien, which Scott quickly accepted. Inspired by the story, Scott, an avid visualist, created extensive storyboards, including the spaceship and space suits, taking inspiration from 2001 A Space Odyssey and Star Wars, and impressed 20th Century Fox doubled the film's budget from 4.2 million to 8.4. O'Bannon introduced Scott his own inspiration, the artwork of H.R. Giger. Giger's painting, Necronom 4, embodied everything they wanted from the film's antagonist, and they asked the studio to hire him as a designer. Hans Rudi Giger was a contemporary surrealist artist, educated in architecture and industrial design, yet preoccupied by the biological and organic form. The two influences are melded in Giger's instantly recognisable biomechanical visual themes. Although most widely recognised for his work on the Alien films, Giger was prolific in all aspects of his artistic career, lending his visual style to film direction, architecture and video games as well as designing furniture, album covers and even guitars. For Alien, Giga would work on all aspects of the Alien and its environment including the surface of the planetoid, the derelict spacecraft and all forms of the Alien from the egg to the adult. Giga began working at Shepparton Studios in July of 78 and finished in December. With its relatively small budget for the time, it certainly wasn't a small movie. Ridley Scott was constantly under pressure from the producers to get the shots done, which caused great tension. 
the crew were behind Ridley all the way and felt he was producing plenty of setups to remain on schedule and they had no idea why the producers and Fox were breathing down his neck because they were so impressed with the dailies. The set pieces were huge, the main spaceship and the corridors to the main rooms were all connected so the cast felt they were on a real spacecraft. The confinement helped add to the thriller aspect, like there was no escape which really helped the actors and their performances to heighten the scale of the space jockey and the exterior of the Nostromo as it landed on the planetoid. They used Ridley's children and one of the cameramans so everything around them looked bigger. A very simple yet clever technique. Dan O'Bannon and Ronald Chusep wrote all the film's seven roles as generic male characters with the suggestion that the crew is unisex and all the parts are interchangeable for men or women. Scott was therefore free to interpret the characters as he wished and to cast accordingly. They wanted the Nostromo's crew to resemble working astronauts in a realistic environment, a concept summed up as truckers in space. Ridley Scott sought to hire strong actors for the film so he could focus his direction on creating and capturing a specific visual style which has become a common practice of his. Ridley Scott wrote several pages of backstory for each character. Tom Skerritt plays Dallas, the captain of the Nostromo. Dallas is a very relaxed and approachable captain, but always tries to avoid getting into arguments and heated debates. He sticks to the rules and doesn't want the extra stress, especially when dealing with Ripley and her disagreements with science officer Ash and his attempts to deal with the facehugger. Newcomer Sigourney Weaver plays Ripley, the warrant officer aboard the Nostromo. Sigourney Weaver was well known for her work on Broadway and Ridley Scott was so impressed with her audition. Sigourney was the last actor to be cast for the film as the sets were being built and this would end up being her first film. Veronica Cartwright plays Lambert, the Nostromo's navigator. Veronica had been in other horror and science fiction films such as The Birds and Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Having first read for the character of Ripley, she thought she was cast for that role. It was only at a wardrobe fitting in London that she was informed she had in fact been cast as Lambert. Veronica wasn't keen on Lambert's character because of her unstable emotions, but Scott explained it represented the audience's feelings. Harry Dean Stanton plays Brett, the engineering technician. Harry wasn't a fan of science fiction and monster movies and took some convincing from Ridley before he would take on the role, reassuring him that it would be more of a thriller. The character Brett rarely speaks up and just agrees constantly with his close friend Parker. Yafat Koto plays Parker, the chief engineer. Yafat was apparently chosen to add diversity to the Nostromo's crew. His character is very much a union guy who will only assist the crew to his advantage and always complains about money. Yafat drove Ridley nuts with his constant ideas and suggestions. John Hurt plays Kane, the executive officer and eventually the alien's host. John was originally desired for the role but became unavailable. His replacement unfortunately became very ill as filming commenced, not knowing he was a diabetic. And luckily John soon became available and was recast. Ian Holm plays Ash, the ship's science officer, who is revealed to be an android. Ian was the most experienced actor of Alien's cast, a star from theatre with little experience of film, but his acting style translated effortlessly. For most of the film scenes, the alien was portrayed by Balaji Badejo, who they discovered in a local pub. A latex costume was specifically made to fit Balaji's nearly seven foot slender frame. Balaji attended Tai Chi and mime classes in order to create convincing movements for the alien. For some scenes, they used stuntmen for the killing of Brett and when the alien is shot at the escape pod spacecraft. Scott chose not to show the alien in full throughout most of the film, which did surprise the production team who would help create the suit. He wisely chose to show only pieces of it while keeping most of his body in shadow in order to heighten the sense of terror and suspense. So the audience is always wondering where it is. The film opens with a ginormous mining spacecraft called the Nostromo returning to Earth. The ship has a crew of seven who are in stasis for the long journey home. The spacecraft picks up a possible distress signal from a nearby planet and the ship's computer known as Mother awakens the crew. Dallas reveals to the disgruntled crew that they are not home and they have orders to investigate the signal. The Nostromo lands on the unknown planet and Captain Dallas, Kane and Navigator Lambert head out to investigate. As they make their way through the rough terrain they discover the signal was coming from a derelict alien spacecraft. Lambert, ever nervous, wants to go back but Kane insists they must go on. 
They make their way inside and find the remains of a large alien creature, whose ribcage appears to have exploded and Kay notices a burnt out floor, which leads down to another room. Back on the Nostromo, Officer Ripley attempts to translate the transmission and finds it might not be a distress signal, but a possible warning. She wants to retrieve the others, but is stopped by the ship's science officer, Ash, insisting she stays. In the alien ship, Kane discovers a vast chamber containing hundreds of egg-like pods. Upon inspection, the eggs appear to be alive and a spider-like creature springs out, cracks through his space helmet and attaches itself to his face. Dallas and Lambert return the unconscious Kane back to the Nostromo. Ripley refuses to let them aboard, suggesting everyone would then be at risk. But Ash violates protocol, overriding Ripley's authority, and lets them in. The crew attempt to remove the facehugger from Kane's face, but with every move its grip tightens, and it reveals to have blood of corrosive molecular acid, a great defence mechanism. Eventually it seems to let go of its own accord, and dies. Kane awakens not remembering anything that happened apart from a nightmare involving smothering. Before they return to stasis for the rest of their journey home, the crew have their last meal. Kane begins to choke and convulses in pain. The crew struggle to help him and suddenly a small creature bursts from his chest, killing Kane instantly, then shoots off into the depths of the ship. The crew attempts to locate and capture it with motion trackers, nets and electric prods but to little avail, nearly capturing the ship's Cat Jones instead. Engineer Brett is sent to look for him so he doesn't mess with the motion tracker. However, as Brett seeks out Jones, the now fully grown alien appears behind him and grabs his head, cracking it with his extended teeth, and disappears with his body into the cooling ducts. After a heated discussion, the now dwindling crew devises a plan to save themselves, to lure the alien into the airlock and jettison it into space. After 35 years, the visual effects of Alien have really stood the test of time. What still impresses me today is the amazing miniature work. Though motion control photography technology was available at the time and was used heavily on Star Wars, the film's budget would not allow for it on Alien. The visual effects team therefore used a camera with a wide angle lens mounted on a drive mechanism to make slow passes over and around the models, filming at 2.5 frames per second, giving them the appearance of motion. Computers were used to turn the models in different directions, like moving up and down. Very simple commands, but no control over the cameras. The map paintings were beautifully detailed, communicating the large scale of space, and the planetoid looked vast. Even in high definition, it looks fantastic today. The only bits I thought had issues, and does show its limited budget, was the explosion of the Nostromo at the end. The slit scan technique was used to create the beams of light and fire. The first explosion really brings across the size of it, but they cut the sequence so it looks like three explosions, with the final shot repeating the first explosion in its original length. It's only on screen for a matter of seconds, but I always felt it could have had a stronger design or lasted longer, being more spectacular to add to your sense of relief that the alien is gone, or so you think. The egg in Alien is probably still the most detailed prop out of the series. The exterior and interior of the egg looks so lifelike. I love how Kane puts his hand over it and this quick release of gas is heard, which has never been used again in the follow-ups. How it opens looks more mechanical than the others we've seen on film over the years, but the level of detail has so far not been matched, well possibly in Alien Resurrection. The facehugger and its remains once it's inspected by Ash had chunks of fish and shellfish to create its insides. Like the egg, the facehugger in Alien still remains the most detailed prop out of the series, but lacks the movement and scare factor that was later shown in Aliens. The most famous sequence of the film is the chestburster scene. The cast members knew that the creature would be bursting out of John Hurt, as it was in the script, and they had seen the design of the puppet, but they had not been told that the fake blood would also be bursting out in every direction from high pressure pumps. The scene was shot in one take using an artificial torso filled with blood and with John's head and arms coming up from underneath the table. Chestburster was shoved up through the torso by a puppeteer who held it on a stick and pushed it up on cue. When the creature burst through the chest a stream of blood shot directly at Veronica Cartwright. Shocking her enough that she fell over went into hysterics. All the on camera reactions from the actors and especially Veronica were real and you can really see the genuine shock on their faces. 
who couldn't have asked for a better take. When Ash has his head knocked off, they had a little person inside a body double, operating these chicken-like arms. Ian had to have his head stuck through a table, much like John in the chestburster scene, covered in milk and plaster. Ian hated milk, and with it had to gargle when he spoke. Once they created the disconnected Ash head, Ridley wasn't happy with the final results. Something went wrong in the drying process with the latex, and the head shrank, and was left with a silly grin, but they didn't have the money or time to redo it. There are only really a couple of shots that don't fully stand the test of time, but these scenes are small in comparison to everything else which is perfect. All the incredible efforts made by the visual effects production team earned them a well-deserved Academy Award. The score for Alien was composed by Jerry Goldsmith and conducted by Lionel Newman, as requested by 20th Century Fox who wanted a familiar composer. Goldsmith wanted the score to have a romantic yet unfamiliar quality to the sounds, especially in the opening scenes that would build throughout the film into suspense and fear. In an interview Jerry said that the film scared the shit out of him when he first watched it to begin creating his score. He wanted to experience the movie as an audience member that would help influence his writing. The soundtrack is one of Ridley's favourite scores, saying it was seriously threatening but has beauty. The editor Terry Rawlings had tempted the film with as much Jerry Goldsmith's music as he could find because he knew Jerry would be composing it. And many films have a temp track prior to the composer coming in to give a sense of how a scene will play out and to set the mood they want. However, when it came to the final mix, Jerry was very unhappy to find they had used tracks from his work on Freud for the opening of the stasis pods and when the acid drips through the floors of the ship. They also used Howard Hansen's Symphony No. 2 for the end titles. It seemed a lot of Jerry's score was too lush and sounded too traditional. The producers and Ridley wanted a more haunting and strange sound, so in the end they downplayed a lot of Jerry's score in the mix and played up the weird sounds. But a lot of what Jerry wrote is in the film and is still regarded highly to this day. The original score as intended can be heard isolated on the DVD and Blu-ray releases. The soundtrack received an LP release when the film arrived, but it was missing loads of tracks which is usually down to the lack of space on an LP. But over the years it's been released in several versions, but the most complete was the 2007 version by Intrada Records, which featured the same intended score with additional alternative score tracks and the original LP album on a 2 CD set. This release is the first to publish Jerry Goldsmith's complete score, remixed and remastered from the original 1 inch master tapes. There were two video games based on the film in the early 80s. We had the Atari 2600 game that looked and played a lot like Pac-Man as you control Ripley through a maze avoiding the aliens, despite there only being one alien in the film, but it's one of the better Pac-Man clones on the old crusty Atari console. In 1984 for the Spectrum and Commodore 64, a strategy based game was released. Very simple with its graphics, but it turned out to be surprisingly addictive. You give orders to the crew to complete certain challenges, but sometimes they will disobey you if they get too scared. The game was well received and did provide a tense playthrough despite the basic graphics. Definitely worth giving a go. In 2014 we got Alien Isolation, the most effective and scary experience I've had with an Alien related video game. You play as Ripley's daughter Amanda as she attempts to investigate the events of the first film. Amanda is on board a similar mining ship and you get hunted down by an alien. You have to hide to avoid being killed and if it gets too close you can use a flamethrower to help you escape. It's the best way to experience the film on an interactive level. It captures the atmosphere and sense of suspense that you'd want from an alien game. It's highly recommended and one of the best alien video games out there. To hear my full review on the game you can find it on my YouTube channel. I originally saw Alien once Alien 3 arrived on VHS. I played the video game of Alien 3 so my interest in the series was building and I wanted to see the other films. I was aware of the movies beforehand, but I wasn't allowed to see them, even though I saw little bits of Aliens where my sister rented it, and I found it terrifying. I couldn't sit through it. My parents were quite strict on allowing me to watch 15 or 18 rated movies. Even though I was still young to see Alien, I watched it and I was just on the edge of my seat. It's a film you know you shouldn't be watching at your age, 
but I persisted and I was shocked when Kane is killed by the birth of the alien. It's something that will give you nightmares and still to this day the imagery and the sound of his death can haunt you to a certain degree because it's executed with such detail and precision. It's masterful filmmaking. What separates Alien from its sequels is its immense detail and strong atmosphere. It really takes its time to set up the world and for anything to really happen. During that time you get to know the characters and to soak up the sets and it gives you a great sense of the layout of the ship. Many could see this and rightly call it a slow movie and often fans of the series tend to push more towards Aliens as their favourite because of this. It has a faster pace, more violence and a bigger story to tell, but the slow pace of Alien is all part of its master plan, to build up suspense and leave you wondering what's going to happen next. Alien has a very simple plot and it is drawn out over a nearly two hour runtime. In many scenarios that could break a movie, but Ridley keeps you engaged throughout without boring you or leaving you disinterested. With its incredible production design and rousing score by Jerry Goldsmith, you are just glued to your seat. It may be a simple plot, but it's an extremely interesting premise, so it raises many questions about the alien, the spacecraft and the characters' backgrounds. You always have an open ear to find out the answers to these questions. However, 90% of the questions you want answered are never given, so you're left to use your imagination to determine a backstory or an idea that's given to you. The alien spacecraft and the jockey left everyone wanting more info. They gave you that in Prometheus to a large degree, but it ended up leaving many folks more confused. With all fan fiction or prequels, when you are given those answers, it's never what you wanted, because your imagination is often stronger than the eventual answers. It's hard to visualize one's imagination and for it to satisfy everyone. What always fascinated me was the android Ash. They reveal that the company replaced a previous science officer who Dallas worked with five times before they shipped out, so no one knew Ash that well. He seems to fit in within the team and exhibits very human-like qualities, so the audience is unaware of his true identity. It's just when the alien is let loose on the ship, he becomes totally closed off and acts completely different and less communicative, especially with Ripley. When he attacks Ripley he seems to be glitching as if something has malfunctioned within his system, maybe he's breaking his programming that he mustn't attack humans, but you never know his main plan. Was he attempting to go back into stasis once the alien was safe, or maybe being a robot the alien wouldn't attack him? As I said the film raises so many questions that aren't answered, or we are only given small nuggets of information, which can be frustrating but also lead to great discussions with your friends or fans who want to delve deeper into exploring the ideas and mythology of the film. The rich design of the outside and interior of the spacecraft really makes the world so believable. Everything seems to have a function and you believe that everything works. I love the detail of the process to enable the destruction of the ship. It's not like Star Trek or 2001 with their clean interfaces and plain sterile corridors. The art directors and designers have created a working environment more so than Star Wars that pushed that retrofitted and run down look for science fiction. The visuals of space and how Ridley Scott takes his time showing you outside the Nostromo creates a real hostile environment. Space looks so scary and you feel totally alone. It really delivers on the great tagline, in space no one can hear you scream. Space never looked so scary. The cast all provide amazing performances, without a doubt, but Sigourney Weaver, for me, really knocked it out of the park. The one scene that totally made me believe in her performance was when she loses her temper with Parker. You can see the immense stress she is under when she is finally in charge. From that point, she was one of my favourite actresses. Alien is an important part of film history. Like Star Wars, it helped add further to the evolution of science fiction. H.R. Giger designed what is still the most frightening monster that's ever appeared on the big screen. It excels at being a horror, but more so at a thriller. You are constantly wondering what's going to happen next and if the alien will suddenly pop up. Having a female as the lead and the only survivor was a very ballsy move. And from what I can gather, it was the first film to do that. Having just a bunch of regular truckers in space as the main cast was something different. Here was a sci-fi film with believable characters. No one had special powers or looked ridiculously macho and buff. 
just regular folk audiences could relate to and who are just put into a horrifying situation. With its wonderful cast, solid production design and of course the top class direction of Ridley Scott, Alien deserves all the praise and respect it's been given over the years. It only gets better with age and it still works extremely well to this day. It's a must see and deserves to be in everyone's film collection. this. You've been here for three and a half hours. Now, how many different ways do you want me to tell the same story? We sat down there on company orders to get this thing, which destroyed my crew. Are there any species like this hostile organism on LV-426? No, it's a rock. No indigenous life. Why don't you just check out LV-426? Because I don't have to. There have been people there for over 20 years, and they never complained about any hostile organism. What do you mean? What people? Terraformers. Planet engineers. They go in and set up these big atmosphere processes to make the air breathable. Ripley, we have to talk. We've lost contact with the colony on LV-426. You're going out there to destroy them, right? Not to study. Not to bring back but to wipe them out. That's the plan. You have my word on it. All right, I'm in. Who's Snow White? She's supposed to be some kind of consultant. Apparently, she saw an alien one. <laughs> Whoopie fucking do. <laughs> All we know is that there's still no contact with the colony and that a xenomorph may be involved. What exactly are we dealing with here? We sat down on LV-426. One of our crew members was brought back on board with something attached to his face, some kind of parasite. I only need to know one thing, where they are. Just one of those things managed to wipe out my entire crew in less than 24 hours. And if the colonists have found that ship, then there's no telling how many of them have been exposed. OK, let's go. But it looks like uh, the barricade didn't hold. Any bodies? No, sir. Last stand. Yo! Stop your grinning and drop your linen. Found them. Over at the processing station. Sub-level three, under the main cooling towers. Movement! What's the position? Multiple signals! They're closing! Pull your team out, Gorman. July 18th, 1986, Aliens burst onto the screens and proved a huge success at the box office. Fans had to wait seven years for a sequel to the epic sci-fi horror, Alien. The sequel was met with glowing reviews from critics and fans alike, and would become the most popular film out of the series with the fans of the franchise, and endless amounts of merchandise was released over the years, even spawning a comic book series in 1988, continuing the adventures of Ripley, Newt and Hicks. It grows $131 million worldwide on a budget of $18 million and earned an additional $50 million on home rentals once it hit VHS. 
when it came time to the Academy Awards, it was nominated for seven Oscars, with Sigourney Weaver being nominated for her performance. In the end, it won two awards for its visual effects and sound editing. In late 1991 and early 1992, an extended cut of Aliens was released. This was the intended version to be released in theatres, but Fox felt it was too long, so a number of scenes were trimmed out to reduce it by 16 minutes. The special edition cut turned up on Laserdisc and was a must-have title. It also popped up on VHS, but many wanted to get their hands on the new collector's set on Laserdisc. The new scenes show you the people on LV-426, Newt and her parents discovering the alien ship, Ripley discovering her child has passed away, more scenes of the marines, you see them set up the gun turrets to protect themselves from the aliens, and Hicks reveals his first name. The extended cut became the version of aliens everyone chose to watch from then on, and people tend to ignore the theatrical cut. David Geiler declared that back in 1979, Brandywine Productions was intending to make a sequel to Alien, having the full support of 20th Century Fox president Alan Ladd Jr. However, Alan Ladd Jr. soon left the company with Fox's new transition to new owners, and the new management had no interest in the sequel, despite Alien doing well at the box office. Come 1983, Fox had new executives that got interested in continuing Alien. David Geiler pitched the project to one of the executives as a cross between Walter Hill's Southern Comfort and the Magnificent Seven. The executive said that sounded great, and things started to move forward. The producers sought out to find a writer for Alien 2. They came across James Cameron's screenplay for The Terminator, and it was passed on to Geiler, and he was impressed and even put Cameron forward to direct it. Geiler then approached Cameron, who was completing pre-production of The Terminator. A fan of the original Alien movie, Cameron was interested in crafting a sequel that would respect the 79 classic, but also provide a continuation, wanting to go with a full-on combat movie. After four days, Cameron produced an initial draft. A scheduling conflict with actor Arnold Schwarzenegger caused the filming of The Terminator to be delayed by nine months, as Schwarzenegger was filming Conan the Destroyer. This allowed Cameron to return to his Alien script. While filming The Terminator, Cameron wrote 90 pages for Aliens. And although the script was not finished, Fox's new president Larry Gordon was impressed and told him that if the Terminator was a success, he would be able to direct Aliens. Following the success of the Terminator, James Cameron and producer partner Gail Ann Hurd were given approval to direct and produce the sequel to Alien, which was scheduled for release for the summer of 1986. Sigourney Weaver, who played Ellen Ripley, was thrilled to return. She had a good meeting with James Cameron and offered her opinions on the character to help improve the dialogue. 20th Century Fox, however, refused to sign a contract with Weaver over a payment dispute. Even though she wanted to return, she wasn't cheap. Fox had wanted to write her out, but Cameron refused on the grounds that he wouldn't do the movie without Sigourney Weaver attached. With Cameron's persistence, Fox signed the contract and Weaver obtained the salary she wanted, which I believe was around $1 million. David Geiler did reveal that when they got feedback from the public regarding the first film, the public wanted a male lead. If they made a sequel straight afterwards, Ripley wouldn't have returned. The Alien series never had a strong female audience. Even with the sequel pushing strong female characters, they still didn't turn up in strong numbers. They set up production at Pinewood Studios in England and started filming in late September of 1985 and ended in late February of 1986. They also shot sequences at the decommissioned Acton Power Station. The crew thought it was a perfect place to film because of its grilled walkways and numerous corridors, but had to spend money to remove asbestos from the station. You may recognise the set as it was used as the Axis chemical plant in Tim Burton's Batman. Cameron drew inspiration for the alien story from the Vietnam War, and the Marines' attitude reflect that. They are portrayed as cocky and confident of their inevitable victory, but when they find themselves facing a less technologically advanced but more determined enemy, the outcome is not what they expect. The Vietnam theme was used for the visual design of the outfits and vehicles. Concept artists Sid Mead and Ron Cobb were brought on to make the future seem believable, giving it a real industrial design. Sid Mead designed a dropship, Solaco, and APC. Ron Cobb had a hand in designing Hadley's Hope and the interiors, with production designer Peter Lamont bringing them all to life. James Cameron was bound by a low budget and tight deadline. He found it difficult to adjust to the working practices of the British crew, who were part of the unions. They were entitled to tea breaks, lunches, and dinners, which brought the production to a halt each day. The crew were admirers of Ridley Scott, but many believe that Cameron was too young and inexperienced to direct. Despite Cameron's attempts to show them his previous film, The Terminator, which had not yet been released in the UK, they refused to watch it. 
The crew were dedicated to their craft, but had no emotional investment in the movie, unlike James Cameron. So there was personality clashes down to the pace of their work. All I can say is us Brits need a cup of tea and a sandwich to function. Without a cup of tea especially, we are useless. Cameron also clashed with the original director of photography, Dick Bush, who was dictating what the film should look like and wasn't lighting it how Cameron wanted it. So he was fired and replaced with Adrian Biddle, who had worked for many years with Ridley and Tony Scott in the advertising business. There is a big cast of characters, most of them consisting of the Marines, but here are the principal cast members for Aliens. Sigourney Weaver returns to play as Ellen Ripley, being the sole survivor of an alien attack on her ship, the Nostromo. She continues to have nightmares of the monsters and struggles to gain the confidence of the company who failed to believe her and the events on the Nostromo. She is persuaded by Carter Burke to return to LV-426, under the notion they will destroy the aliens. The legendary Michael Bean, who played Carl Reese in James Cameron's previous movie, The Terminator, plays Corporal Dwayne Hicks. He is one of the squad's leaders. He was hastily cast after three weeks of filming, and thus was not present for the military training that the other actors playing the Marines went through. James Remar was originally cast as Hicks. In an interview a couple of years back, Remar stated that he was replaced after a short while of shooting, due to being fired after he was arrested for the possession of drugs which did mess up his working relationship with producer-director Walter Hill. There is one shot of Remar in the film, which is the entrance to the alien hive, but they cut away just before he turns around. Corporal Hicks is a born leader, and is certainly the coolest character out of the Marines when it comes to coping under pressure. He seems instantly infatuated with Ripley, and she seems to be falling for his charms. Stand-up comedian Paul Reiser plays Carter J. Burke, he is a representative from the Weyland yutani Corporation, sent to investigate LV-426. He comes across as very kind and supportive of Ripley as she struggles to cope with being in hypersleep for so long, and helps her with her case with the company, and the reasons as to why she destroyed the Nostromo. But soon Burke begins to see the monetary gain from the aliens, and soon shows his true signs of being a heartless company man. Lance Henriksen plays the android bishop and serves as an executive officer. Lance is another returning actor from James's previous film The Terminator. Bishop is a more advanced android and is programmed not to harm humans, and with his personality he is very honest and open, but Ripley is still paranoid about androids after her last experience with Ash on the Nostromo. Jeanette Goldstein plays Private Vasquez. She is an expert of the smart gun. She is a headstrong tough woman who shows no signs of fear against the aliens, and doesn't like to follow orders instead would rather solve her issues with a gun. Kerry Henn plays Rebecca known as Newt, and is the only survivor of the Connolly on LV-426. According to the casting director, Newt was the most difficult role to cast. Hundreds of school children were auditioned, including many kids who did adverts. Kerry was chosen despite having no previous acting experience. Her brother also got a small part in the film, playing Newt's brother, shown in the extended scenes. Later in life, she chose not to continue acting and chose to pursue a career in teaching, and still remains good friends with Sigourney Weaver. Bill Paxton plays Private Hudson. Bill had met James Cameron four years earlier while he was working as a set director, and Bill also turned up in The Terminator. At the time, Bill had just made Weird Science, and just after working on Aliens, he would star in Near Dark, which also starred Lance Hendrickson and Jeanette Goldstein. He is a very cocky character and likes to mess around, but becomes a nervous wreck once the aliens attack and struggles to control his emotions. William Hope plays Lieutenant Gorman, the Marine's inexperienced commanding officer. He struggles to gain any respect from the Marines due to his age and lack of combat drops. Like Hudson, he struggles to cope under pressure and makes fatal errors when the Marines enter the alien hive. Al Matthews plays Sergeant Lapone. Matthews attributed his casting to his military experience and helped train the actors during the production. Some folks may remember him from his appearance in Superman 3 as the fire chief at the chemical plant. Chief, how can I help? Get this man a helmet. Oh, yes. you, forget the helmet. How bad is it? My God, Superman, it's a nightmare. Everything in there is either explosive or flammable or worse. And finally, we have Mark Ralston playing Private Drake. Drake is another expert of the smart gun and is clearly in love with Vasquez. The movie opens with Ellen Ripley drifting in space. She is discovered by a deep salvage team and taken back to a space station above Earth. She is resting in hospital and meets a rep from Weyland Yutani. Carter Burke passes on the details of her long hypersleep. She has been floating around in space for 57 years and she finds out her daughter has passed away. Her employers then debrief her over the destruction of the ship, the Nostromo. 
they are sceptical of her claims that an alien killed the ship's crew and forced her to destroy the expensive ship. The planet she claims they found the alien was LV-426. The reps say there is no life on that planet and reveal people have been living there for over 20 years as part of their terraforming business. When contact is lost with Hadley's Hope, Carter and Colonial Marine Lieutenant Gorman ask Ripley to accompany Burke and the Marines to investigate why contact has been lost. Traumatised by her encounter with the alien, Ripley has been having nightmares. She refuses at first but makes Burke promise to destroy the aliens for her to take part. Aboard the spaceship, the USS Soloco, she is introduced to the Colonial Marines and the android Bishop, towards whom Ripley is initially hostile following her experience with the homicidal android Ash from the first movie. Bishop says the older androids were a bit twitchy and says he cannot harm humans, but Ripley struggles to believe him. She explains to the Marines what happened on the Nostromo, but they don't take her seriously and fail to comprehend what dangers they face. They prepare for battle and the dropship delivers a team to the surface, where they find a colony deserted. They find makeshift barricades and signs of a struggle, but no bodies, acid burns, two live facehuggers in containment tanks in the medical lab, and a survivor, a traumatised young girl nicknamed Newt, who uses the ventilation system to evade the aliens. Hudson uses the computers on site to locate the colonists grouped beneath the fusion-powered atmosphere processing station. They head to the location in the APC and descend down the levels to find the alien hive. They find the colonists cocooned, serving as incubators for the alien's offspring. When the marines kill a newborn alien, the aliens wake up and surprise the marines by coming out the walls. They kill and capture several of them. Gorman panics due to his lack of experience and struggles to make them fall back to the APC. Ripley loses her temper and takes control of the car and rams it through the nest to rescue the remaining marines, Hicks, Hudson and Vasquez. Ripley says they should nuke the entire site from orbit, but Burke pleads they can't exterminate these species. With Hicks now in charge, he orders the dropship to recover the survivors and follows Ripley's idea, but a stowaway alien kills the pilots, causing it to crash. Ripley, Newton, Burke and the remaining marines barricade themselves in the colony. They find out it will take 17 days for another rescue team to come. Ripley does some investigating and discovers that Burke deliberately set the colonists to investigate the derelict spaceship and didn't warn them about the aliens. Burke believes he could become wealthy by recovering alien specimens for use as biological weapons. She threatens to expose him but Bishop informs the group of a greater danger. The power plant was damaged during the battle and will soon detonate with the force of a 14 megaton thermonuclear weapon giving them only four hours to escape. The Academy Award winning effects have for the most part stood the test of time. Even watching them on Blu-ray, the miniatures and reprojection work look fantastic. James Cameron and his team made use of every trick in the book to make the visual effects work and pretty much all of them are within camera with limited optical work. Brothers Robert and Dennis Skotak were hired to supervise the visual effects having previously worked with Cameron on several Roger Corman movies, such as Galaxy of Terror and Battle Beyond the Stars. Two stages at Pinewood were used to construct the colony on LV-426, using miniature models that were on average 6 feet tall and 3 feet wide. James Cameron used miniatures and several effects to make scenes look larger than they actually were, including rear projection, mirrors, beam splitters, camera splits and foreground miniatures, the most impressive being the entrance to the alien hive. Practical effects supervisor John Richardson declared the biggest challenge for him was creating the forklift power loader exoskeletons. The giant model could not stand on its own, requiring either wires dangling from the shoulders or a pole through the back attached to a crane. While Sigourney Weaver was inside the power loader, a stuntman standing behind it would move the arms and legs. The alien suits were more flexible and durable than the ones used in Alien. They removed the plastic light dome on the alien's head from the original design. In fear it would break easily despite the creature designers making attempts to use it. The new design suits expanded on the creature's movement and allowed them to crawl and jump around the set. Dancers and gymnasts and stuntmen were hired to portray the aliens. They would often use wires to make them crawl up the walls or jump from side to side to attack their victims. Mannequins were also created to make aliens stand in inhuman poses and would have their bodies explode to simulate gunshot wounds. Stan Winston's team created fully articulated facehuggers that could move their fingers which were operated by a little motor, working very much like a wind-up toy. Wires were used to pull them along or make them pounce on the camera. 
The redesign of the facehugger wasn't as detailed as the 79 version, but were far more practical to use in Aliens. The most difficult effect involved in the film was the Alien Queen and her interaction with the Power Loader. A life-sized mock-up was created by Stan Winston's company in the United States. Once the design was approved, the crew working on the Queen flew to England and began working on the final version. Standing at 14 feet tall, it was operated using a mixture of puppets, control rods, hydraulics and a crane above to support it. Two puppeteers were inside the suit operating its arms and 16 other operators were required to move it. All sequences involving the full-size Queen were filmed in camera. With no post-production manipulation, no rotoscoping was used to paint out anything. James Cameron knew exactly how to shoot it to hide the crane and cables operating it. Additionally, a miniature Alien Queen and power loader was used for certain scenes. Some of the most impressive sequences for me is when the dropship lands and drops off the APC. Seeing the dropship explode and the footage they took, they rear projected behind the actors so they could react to the explosion and when Ripley is left on the platform as everything around her is falling apart. It cuts to miniatures and rear projection. The shots are all so seamless. Certainly some of the best in-camera effects from the 80s. There are a few shots that are a bit wobbly. The stop motion puppet of the Queen always made me laugh. The blue screen shot of the power loader is very obvious. It was nice to see they repaired the effects shot of Bishop catching Newt. There used to be a visible hole in the ground for Lance to hide his torso. But thankfully it's been digitally removed. Superman 4 was released about a year later and had a similar size budget. And that film looked super cheap. But Aliens looked like a $40 million movie. It just goes to show when you have a director who knows what he is doing and what he wants, restricted budgets can push people to be more creative and Aliens is a perfect example. The late James Horner who was now an established and well respected composer in 1986 thanks to his efforts on Star Trek 2 and 3, and Krull, composed a score to Aliens. James Cameron and his wife Gail Ann Hurd put Horner under a lot of pressure due to the constant changes to the film. They gave him little time to write the score. Horner arrived in London expecting the film to be locked down with its final edit, but to his shock they were still filming and editing. So any music he wrote for a scene could be later cut out or trimmed, destroying the timing of his music. Abbey Road recording studios were outdated, and he struggled to patch in the synthesizers he wanted to use, adding further to his problems. With the theatrical release looming, there was only six weeks left, and he wanted Cameron to push the film back by four weeks, so he could be 100% satisfied with the score, but Cameron wouldn't budge, and Horner felt he could only achieve 80% of what he wanted. The final cue for the scene in which Ripley battles the alien queen was written overnight. Cameron completely reworked the scene, leaving Horner to rewrite the music, which kept him up all night trying to make the music fit. He felt he was treated badly by both Cameron and his wife, due to their lack of experience with working with orchestral scores and the time needed to produce the soundtrack. When it came to recording the music, he did it in roughly four days. Despite his troubles and extreme stress, Horner received an Academy Award nomination for Best Original Score, so all the hard work did pay off in the end. The tension between him and Cameron was so high, he felt they would never work together again. But come 1997, Cameron wanted him to score Titanic after being impressed by his work on Braveheart, and they rekindled their friendship. The soundtrack did get released on LP about a year after the film's release, and had roughly 40 minutes of music, and was later reissued on CD and given a deluxe edition featuring more tracks. The score itself I find to be far more effective than Jerry Goldsmith's work on Alien, Jerry's is certainly more lush and romantic with its themes, and of course it has those unsettling moments in the music to really build up the tension. But Horner's music is really effective in making you jump, and seems far more threatening to heighten those shock moments. Horner does homage some of the sounds used in Alien, and due to his lack of time they use part of Jerry's score when the Queen Alien chases Ripley into the lift. The famous part of the score is the climax at the end when Ripley and Bishop escape the atmosphere plant and when she finally defeats the Queen. The music cue was used in endless amounts of trailers. It's proper trailer fodder music, and I've used it a couple of times in my reviews of other films. It's a perfect way to build up excitement quickly. The military march is very simple and works well throughout the film, but really comes into its own when it kicks in during Ripley's attempts to save the Marines. It's a really aggressive percussion sound that does the whole scene justice. 
I do really like the score, but I don't think it lends itself to easy listening. A couple of the tracks you can happily enjoy by themselves, but the music works better with the visuals. The soundtrack is easy to obtain, the deluxe CD was given a wide release, so you should be able to hunt it down for a cheap price. Aliens Got Tie-In Games released across a number of platforms during the later part of the 80s. For the 8-bit microcomputers there were two releases, one developed by Software Studios and the other by Activision. The first version is known as Aliens US in the UK. It was a game consisting of six mini-games. The first level you're flying the dropship, the second you're searching the corridors, the third you're shooting oncoming aliens, the fourth making your way through the ventilation system, the fifth level you're trying to find Newt, and then the final level you're facing off against the Queen. Reviews were certainly mixed when it came out, but it seems to have received more favourable reviews over time. The second release was a totally different game. It had a first person perspective as you switch between the characters as you search the colony and try and kill the aliens. I played it as a kid and it was pretty intense, but it didn't really offer much variety in gameplay, but it was a unique game for the time. The reviews were strong when it was released and it's certainly worth giving a go for a quick playthrough. Aliens also turned up on the MSX console developed by Squaresoft titled Aliens Alien 2. It's a standard platform game as you play as Ripley. You make your way through various stages in an attempt to find Newt. You face off against a queen alien who pops up as an emboss on many of the levels. With it being released in 1987, the graphics aren't too bad. The animation and detail is pretty good, so it would be worth giving a go if you enjoy your retro games. For the arcades, Konami released a two-player action game in 1990. It was a fun and enjoyable platform shooter that took many liberties with the license but didn't deter anyone's enjoyment of it. It was a serious coin guzzler, so don't expect to complete it on 50p or £1. It was never ported to any consoles or computers at the time, so it remained in the arcades, but you can easily emulate it on your PC or Apple Mac. Alien Trilogy popped up on the PlayStation, Sega Saturn and PC in 1996 and was a big success, especially in Europe, on the PlayStation. The game was loosely based on the series and is really inspired from the second film. You have all the weapons featured throughout Aliens and even features footage from the film. It was an enjoyable shooter for the time and had some good graphics. Returning to the game recently, I found the controls to be very clunky. It's certainly worth hunting down though to add to your collection. You can probably find it very cheap on eBay. Aliens Colonial Marines arrived in 2013 on the PS3, 360 and PC. The hype for this game was huge. It had been announced back in 2006 and was delayed heavily over the years and bits of information and photos were released to whet people's appetites. A demo was shown at E3 and PAX showing off what the game looked like and fans got super pumped to finally play a dedicated aliens based game. For a long time you could play as a colonial marine in the Alien vs Predator series but to have a game dedicated to them was a dream come true and with it being a sequel to Aliens it intrigued many on how they will continue the storyline. When the game was finally released it was a total mess. The game was riddled with bugs, glitchy graphics and broken gameplay mechanics. The game failed to live up to the promises made in the demo that got everyone so excited. It ended up looking worse. Gamers were furious feeling that they had been lied to. There was a patch for the PC version to improve the detail and lighting of the game and to correct many of the bugs and dodgy AI but it wasn't enough to make up for the promises they made. I picked up the game on release for the 360 and just before I set out to pick it up I saw the reviews that were published that day and I was gutted but I thought sod it I loved Aliens I wanted to play it no matter what. I played it through that weekend and to be honest I didn't think it was awful. There were obvious problems with it but I think the amount of hype and changes made to the final game people went a bit overboard with their overall review and critique. They were right to be upset but some reviewers made out the game was unplayable. I'm not saying it's great, it's a very mediocre game, but I did get some enjoyment out of it. It's super cheap now on consoles because no one wants it anymore, so you can get it for about £5 or less. My first experience with Aliens was in the early 90s. My older sister, who I have mentioned before, rented a lot of horror movies and I would often sneak in to watch some of them. My parents were pretty strict on what I could watch as a kid so I'd have to do it when they were not around. When I watched Aliens for the first time, I couldn't sit through it as a kid. It terrified me. It wasn't until later on once Alien 3 came out on VHS and the desire to seek out the other movies, I finally got to see Aliens all the way through and it blew me away. It was one of the most impressive movies I saw growing up and with it being a sequel, it just surprised me how it managed to match the first film 
but also contributes so much more to the universe and expanded characters. Seeing the aliens in large numbers jumping off the walls and falling through the ceilings to surprise the marines was intense and thrilling to watch. It makes no attempts to hide what it is, it's a combat movie, it's all out action with horror thrown in. Some may not put the film into a horror category, but I disagree. I think the level of horror and scares really match any movie that is declared a straight out horror. You can be more terrified by this movie than say a Halloween or an Elm Street film. It is as scary as Alien but uses horror in a different way. In the first film I think the way it goes out to scare the audience is different. Alien gives the viewer a stronger sense of atmosphere and the unknown, whereas the sequel it relies on jump scares and a sense of being outnumbered and having little time to escape which amplifies the tension throughout. People always make comparisons to this one and the first movie. They are both great films and have many positive aspects but they are really different movies and it boils down to one's personal taste and what you want from an Alien film. I think Aliens is easier to watch, it's a movie that offers a lot more story and excitement. Alien is a slower movie and relies heavily on its atmosphere and the unknown to keep you going. You are constantly second guessing when the alien is going to attack. Watching Alien you often have to be in the right mood to sit through it, whereas Aliens is more accessible. The sequel I think has a wider appeal. It has the horror, the action, the humour and characters you feel more invested in and care about. What makes Aliens so enjoyable is its characters. Many horror or action films with a large cast it's hard to be invested in all of them, but James Cameron has given enough screen time and dialogue for the principal cast to make the audience feel invested in their journey and their well-being. Obviously Burke is an arsehole and is written to be one, but Gorman who's inexperienced in the field causing the team to fail their first mission pushes the audience to be frustrated with him but redeems himself near the end by showing he still has the courage despite his errors in the past. Hudson is clearly everyone's favourite, so many classic lines of dialogue and seeing his enthusiasm on screen makes even the most sceptical viewer fall in love with his performance. Hudson cracks mentally once they first encounter the aliens and seems to be losing the plot but he gains his confidence back and shows his true colours but sadly gets pulled through the floor and is taken away. When seeing this happen you feel so gutted that he is essentially killed off because he is such a great character. This is what the movie does so well, you care about them. If say you put on Alien vs Predator, you don't give a toss about the human characters and if they are going to get killed off. That's the beauty of James Cameron's writing and direction, you are emotionally invested in its story. Sigourney Weaver is amazing yet again in the sequel. Her nomination at the Academy Awards was totally justified, it's just a shame she didn't win. I love how Ripley is not portrayed as a macho woman. She doesn't have superpowers, she's just a normal person, just as fragile as the rest of us. She is emotional and has strong motherly tendencies, but what keeps her together is her headstrong attitude and willingness to fight on. Even though she is terrified of these monsters, she is the only one to take charge and think clearly on how to keep everyone safe until they can find a way to get off the planet. Once Newt is captured, she totally conquers her fears and goes straight into the alien's nest to save her. Ripley has now become the surrogate mother of Newt in a short space of time. Once she defeats the Queen, Newt calls her mummy. It's such a sweet way to end the film. It's just so annoying what happened to Newt and Hicks in Alien 3. I wanted them to be a family. With the announcement of Alien 5 and seeing Ripley and Hicks return in the sequel to Aliens, ignoring the events of Alien 3 and 4, we'll hopefully get to see that family unit again. I hope what it eventually becomes is great, but it could just turn out to be mad fan fiction that backfires and ends up being a letdown. The company, i.e. Weyland Nutani, doesn't seem as evil as they're made out to be in the first Alien and even the third film. She gets grilled by the company but isn't charged with the damages to the Nostromo, but told to seek psychiatric help and has her pilot license taken away. When it comes to returning to LV-426, they are willing to reinstate her position within the company if she assists them. Now with obtaining the facehuggers to return back to Earth, it seems that Burke is operating on his own accord, seeing the monetary value in them and not following orders from the company. He may have had confirmation from the military side of the company to retrieve them, but that is never made clear. Burke himself seems totally cool when everything kicks off. It's like he seems untouchable because he is with the company, seeming totally unfazed by what's going on. 
I've never had any problems with Aliens. It's pretty much a flawless movie with its storytelling, visuals and performances. The only minor issues I have with it is the special edition version. The acting from Newt and her parents are a bit hammy and cheesy. We can't blame Carrie Henn because she had no acting experience, but the parents I presume have, and it feels like a scene from a cheap B movie. The repeated shots of the aliens exploding during the gun turret sequence, you can see they have been lifted from the hive sequence, so they obviously didn't shoot enough footage of the dummy aliens exploding during production. They edit these shots quickly so it's not blatantly obvious, but on repeated viewing you can tell the budget is limited, but that's only a minor nitpick. I personally don't watch the theatrical cut anymore, last time I saw it must have been on TV like 15 years ago. All the added footage in the extended cut add scenes that are valuable to the main story. I think in a theatrical sense, yeah, it could be seen as a bit too long, hence why they cut it down. People may start fidgeting in their seats or their bums go to sleep, but on a home video medium, it's totally ideal and worth its running time. James Cameron treats Ridley Scott's film with the utmost respect. He doesn't attempt to remake it, but add further to it and builds upon it with fresh new ideas. It's a solid sequel that to many matches and even beats the first film. The original 79 classic is a gorgeous looking movie and is a piece of art, whereas Aliens is a bit more rough around the edges because it relies on a more industrial look for its production design. So on a visual level, it's not as strong, but it makes up for it by giving you a larger world, breaking away from the corridors and tight conditions of the Nostromo. Some people may prefer that more claustrophobic feeling, but with a sequel, you have to give the audience more and it does that to an exceptional level. The sound design for the film is incredible. The sound of the pulse rifles and smart guns are probably some of the best uses of sound for a machine gun. It's up there with Robocop's pistol. It makes it a joy to listen to and watch once the marines let rip and gun down the aliens. It's always so much fun playing video games based around these weapons. It makes it exciting just to relive those great moments from the film. Aliens is in my top 5 favourite films. In my eyes it does everything right. It's probably one of the best sequels out there. It has a start, middle and an end, and it's not reliant on a follow up to continue its story, thus giving the movie its own identity and making it stand on its own. Alien is its backstory to give it momentum, but it takes everything in a different direction. You would be a fool not to own this film. It's one of James Cameron's best movies, and one of the best sci-fi action horror films ever made. This is a maximum security prison. And you have no weapons of any kind? As some of you know, a 337 model EEV Crash landed here at 0600 on the morning watch. There was one survivor, two dead, and a droid that was hopelessly smashed beyond repair. The survivor is a woman. With 25 prisoners in this facility, all double white promos. All thieves, rapists, murderers, child molesters, all scum. I don't want to upset the order. I don't want ripples in the water. And I don't want a woman walking around giving them ideas. One of the prisoners has been killed. Really? Hmm. Oh. Yeah, Shaft. Poor sod backed into a nine-foot fan. I found something at the accident site, just a bit away from where it happened. A mark, a burn. I receive word from the network. I may point out this is the first high-level communication this installation has ever received, to my knowledge. Does the company know? The company knows everything that happened on the ship. They want this woman looked after. They consider her to be very high priority. Why? I have no idea.
On the 22nd of May 1992, Alien 3 hit the big screen in the USA, and it wasn't till three months later that it arrived in the UK. Produced with a large budget of $50 million, it made $159 million worldwide, and additional $31 million when it hit the home rental market. Fans had been waiting six years for a new sequel to the beloved franchise, but many were left disappointed by the movie's script and the bleak, depressing tone of the film. I think many felt conned by the early teasers for the movie, which suggested it was going to be set on Earth. Critics as well were left underwhelmed by the film and expressed their dissatisfaction with it. Despite the mostly mixed reviews, it was received well in European and Asian markets, but couldn't capture the American market as 20th Century Fox had hoped. In April of 1992, an alien-themed attraction opened in Glasgow, called Alien War, created by John Gorman and Gary Gillius. It had a short run before it opened in the basement of the Chocadero Centre in London in October of 1993. A number of cast members such as Sigourney Weaver and Brian Glover attended its opening, and they praised its efforts to recreate the scares and excitement of the films. The attraction escorted the public around similar sets to aliens, and a group of marines have to protect them as they lead them to safety once the aliens begin to attack. It sadly closed in 1996 due to flooding, and made a short return in late 1999, but sadly never was reinstated as a permanent attraction. I never got the chance to visit Alien War as a kid, but a few of my friends got the chance, they loved it and found it terrifying. Since the film's release, many articles and interviews detailing the troubled production began to surface, with director David Fincher and the studio butting heads throughout the shoot. David Fincher has pretty much disowned the film over time, not in an official capacity, but he really expressed his anger towards the studio, who he felt treated him badly. He says no one hates the movie more than him. Fincher felt many on the production resented him at the time because of his young age. Taking orders from someone considerably younger than most of the crew didn't go down too well, as they felt he was less experienced than them, which of course wasn't really the case. He rarely wants to talk about the film now and was asked a number of times to be involved with the DVD and Blu-ray special editions, but declined, indicating that he had washed his hands of the movie and no longer wished to talk about it at great length. The producers at Brandywine, who produced Alien and Aliens, weren't too keen to do a sequel, despite everyone else wanting to see one. They didn't want to do a repeat of the first two movies. They had come up with some ideas in 1988 about a prison in space, or a scientific lab conducting experiments. Writer William Gibson was hired in the early stages to pen a script, which had Ripley in a coma and focused around Hicks as he deals with Wayland yutani building an alien empire. They had approached Ridley Scott to direct, but he was unavailable. Rennie Harlin, hot off Elm Street Part 4, was offered the job of directing and instantly took it. Rennie wanted to push the idea of visiting the planet where the aliens came from, choosing to ignore Gibson's script. Further ideas were developed about setting it on Earth, as the first official teaser trailer had hinted at. A number of other writers, such as Eric Redd, wrote a new screenplay, which he later disowned. Red later revealed that he had rushed it due to a tight schedule, and many of the ideas in the plot were built up over meetings with the producers and the studio, so he felt the story wasn't his. Writer David Toohey, who went on to write and direct the Riddick series, had been hired to provide a new take on the sequel, and completed a script that focused around prisoners in space, which became the focus point of the later screenplays. He didn't have Ripley in it because the female audiences were still not flocking to see the series so the idea was to have a male lead, something William Gibson's script also focused on, but Fox argued against this and wanted Ripley to return. Sigourney Weaver had been approached and offered a large fee to play Ripley again, but by this point with the constant script changes, Rennie Harlin jumped ship after a year of prepping the movie. He didn't want to see more guns and aliens, and the script felt all too familiar. His idea of the planet of the aliens was also too expensive to even produce, Fox weren't happy with his decision to leave, but understood that he had lost the passion to make it, and instead offered him Die Hard 2. David Geiler around this time had seen Vincent Ward's The Navigator, a medieval odyssey, which was praised by critics and had done well at many film festivals. Vincent was offered the job but turned it down a number of times, because he wasn't interested in sequels, but he eventually gave in to their persistence and read their most current script. He wasn't impressed. Fox invited him to visit and pitch them his idea for the sequel. On the flight over, he came up with the idea of a planet made of wood, floating in space. It was inhabited by monks who had left Earth to create their own world, rules, and to live without technology, essentially living in a medieval landscape, 
but the core of the planet had advanced technology to keep their world going and sustain its own atmosphere. Ripley crash lands on the planet and she is taken into care. There is frustration between the monks as they don't allow women on the planet to avoid sexual temptation and for fear of breaking the harmony she is thrown into a prison cell. Not long afterwards the monks are being killed off by the alien that had stowed away in the escape pod and the monks blame her for the deaths believing she has brought the devil with her. She befriends one of the monks and begins to have morning sickness and she realises she was impregnated by the alien. Fox loved the basic idea of what Vincent Ward wanted to do and so did Sigourney Weaver who was adamant that Ripley should die at the end because she wanted the series to be wrapped up. However, Vincent, at the request of Fox, later wrote an ending that would have Ripley survived by the monks conducting an ancient procedure that pushes the alien out of her chest. About a month later, after Vincent's meeting in early 1990, Fox announced a release date of 1992, which put huge amounts of pressure on him to deliver the film in time, and at that point he was still trying to develop the script and expand his ideas. The head of the studio was banking on this movie being a huge hit and it would be the movie to keep them afloat, which to this day I still find baffling. The Alien films were always made on limited budgets, not small, but weren't given the huge numbers that say James Bond or the Superman films received. The Alien films did well at the box office, but they weren't making 200 million plus, so for Fox to put everything into this movie seems strange, especially for an R-rated film. The production started moving forward and Pinewood Studios in London was booked. Many talented artists based in the UK jumped on board because of the enthusiasm for Vincent's script, so sets started to be built under the supervision of Norman Reynolds. However, the concepts were becoming diverse among the production crew. Vincent was taking his time on making final decisions, delaying crew in getting to work, and Fox with Brandywine were concerned about the logistics of creating and maintaining a wooden planet. They were puzzled as to how in the story it got there and how it worked and so suggested maybe a mining facility instead. Vincent made it clear that they had signed off on the Wooden Planet concept. Subsequently, Fox came back with a list of things they wanted changed and were very aggressive in their demands. The Wooden Planet idea they claimed was too artsy-fartsy and his vision wasn't suited for a big commercial movie. Vincent tried to talk his way around the issues but was unsuccessful and ultimately fired. In stepped David Fincher, who was very young at the time, around 26 years old. He had built up a name for himself directing commercials and successful music videos for artists such as Madonna with Vogue and Express Yourself. Plus he worked at the FX company ILM during the 80s. David was offered the job and was very enthusiastic. Ridley Scott's Alien was one of his favourite movies and David very much wanted to bring his vision to the series. Fincher had a tough task ahead of him though, having to deal with a script that was constantly being changed on the day of shooting, which made it difficult for him to plan ahead. He was put in a situation with too many cooks in the kitchen and studio production executives looking over his shoulder, offering their opinions on what he should shoot, wanting him to get the shots done faster. David would do a large amount of takes to get the perfect shot needed, which frustrated the heads of the studio who were trying to keep a close eye on the escalating costs. Another problem occurred with David's original choice of cinema photographer, Jordan Cronenworth, who had photographed Blade Runner. He had to be replaced by Alex Thompson after a couple of weeks because it became apparent that he was suffering from Parkinson's. Studio ADI were hired to design the alien, creature effects and makeup prosthetics but under the guidance of H.R. Giger, who had been hired by producer Gordon Carroll to redesign the alien as only one alien was making an appearance in the film. David Fincher wanted a puma-like beast that had erotic features. Giger, who worked from his office in Zurich, gave the alien human lips so it would kiss its victims and its human-like tongue would go inside their mouth and then pull out their innards. Which if they had shot, it would have been pretty grotesque. The alien would appear more elegant by removing the tubes around the spine and with the inclusion of a longer chest and legs, so it appeared sleeker. He also produced a young alien which they called the Bambi Burster, which ended up being the only design they used from Giga. Giga had produced so many designs that Tom Woodruff and Alec Gillis of Studio ADI had little time to take them all on and instead took advice from David Fincher. They tried to stay faithful to Giga's designs but kept things more in line with what had come before. During the early stages of shooting, Michael Bean had caught wind that they had killed off his character, which pissed him off and later the fans once they eventually saw the movie. Fox included his likeness without his permission, so the studio and Michael negotiated a large fee for its use. Michael later regretted it not knowing David Fincher would go on to be a successful director and in hindsight said David could have used his image for free if he put him in one of his future movies. 
because of the constant changes to the script and friction between Fincher and the studio, the film was never finished at Pinewood. They closed the production and had to make a list of stuff they needed completed to deliver a finished movie, then shot the rest of the footage in LA. There were endless arguments about how much extra footage David could shoot and how much it will cost. They spent a whole year editing the film trying to fix and make quick changes by individuals who weren't experts in filmmaking. They didn't have a clear vision, it was all done to keep costs down and what they thought the film should be. Fincher got more and more depressed by the end and pretty much left the production doing its final stages before its release. Now for the large cast of Alien 3 we have a mix of American and British actors. First of course is Sigourney Weaver who is back to play Ripley and is the sole survivor from the Sirocco. Sigourney's fee was considerably increased since she last played the character and received a large bonus to shave her head. She also took on the role of co-producing and injected some of her own ideas into the script. The lack of guns and wanting to kill off her character was something she very much pushed for. The legend that is Charles Dance plays Jonathan Clemens, a former inmate who now serves as the facility's doctor. He treats Ripley after her escape pod crashes at the start of the film and forms a special bond with her. Fincher initially screen tested and offered the role to Richard E. Grant. The producers argued against his choice, feeling Richard was too young and soft to be a prisoner and preferred Charles Dance who also tested for the role. Brian Glover, who passed away in 1997, plays the prison warden Harold Andrews. He believes Ripley's presence will cause disruption amongst the inmates and attempts to control the rumours surrounding her and the creature. Brian was often cast as a tough guy in many of his TV roles. He first started out as a wrestler and then moved into acting. I remember him as a kid as the voice of the Tetley T adverts and Richie and Eddie's neighbour in the TV show Bottom. With many actors who play bad guys, they are always super nice and kind in real life and David Fincher would often seek counsel from Brian when he was stressed out or upset. Charles S. Dutton plays Dylan who functions as the spiritual guidance and leader amongst the prisoners and attempts to keep the peace in the facility whilst also having a short temper and doesn't like to be told what to do. Paul McGann plays Golic, a mass murderer and outcast amongst the prisoners and is a complete nutcase. Golic becomes obsessed with the alien after he sees it kill his friends and in the assembly cut he feels he has a connection to the alien and jeopardises the group's plan to trap it. You may notice Paul's accent changes halfway through the film as Paul saw his character as like Charles Manson. David Fincher didn't like that approach so he ended up changing his voice and sounding like he was from Liverpool. Ralph Brown plays Aaron, the assistant of Superintendent Andrews. The prisoners refer to him by his nickname 85 after some of the prisoners discovered his IQ score which drives him mad. Ralph I'm sure many remember from With Nail and I as Danny the Dealer. Little tend to make you very high. It would have been interesting to have Paul McGann joined alongside Richard E. Grant as well, having the cast of With Nail and I reunited in space. Danny Webb plays Morse and is my favourite of the prisoners and provides most of the humour. Fuck! He is a very cynical person and is only concerned about his well-being and would rather wait for the company to arrive to kill the alien, but during the course of the movie he becomes more supportive of Ripley and caring for the others. What the fuck are you doing? What? Don't hold it like that! Hold it like this! What the You'll fuck? fucking kill someone, you fucking moron! Christopher Fairbank plays Murphy, the first victim of the alien, and he is the owner of the dog Spike. Christopher had a big career in TV in the UK and recently popped up in Guardians of the Galaxy, but I'm sure many of you will remember him from Tim Burton's 1989 blockbuster hit, Batman. Hey, do you want your cut of this money or not? Now shut up! Shut up! Lance Henriksen had not intended to return, but was persuaded by Walter Hill, who Lance was good friends with. Lance provides the voice of the damaged Bishop Android, as well as playing a character credited as Bishop 2, who appears at the end of the film claiming to be a human designer of the android. He wants to help Ripley remove the alien, but quickly changes his goal, which is what Ripley feared, that he wants it for the bioweapons division. The late Pete Postlethwaite plays David, an inmate smarter than most, and out of the prisoners enjoys calling Aaron 85. David seems to be the most helpful out of the prisoners despite being a bit of a nervous wreck and is quick to help Ripley and her plans to capture the alien. Christopher John Fields plays Reigns and is the second victim of the alien. Christopher seems to be the only actor from the film to work again with David on multiple movies, such as The Game, Fight Club and Zodiac. Clive Mantle plays William, in the theatrical cut he gets barely any dialogue, but thankfully more of his scenes were included for the assembly cut, but you still don't see him get killed off. I spoke to Clive years ago and asked him about Alien 3, 
and he said they never filmed his death scene and just added a sound clip of him screaming to reference his death. Clive hadn't had much luck during the late 80s and early 90s with his feature film roles. He got totally cut out of Superman 4 playing the first nuclear man and had most of his scenes left on the cutting room floor for Alien 3. Niall Buggy plays the chef Eric. His character is an absolute nervous wreck and likes to avoid confrontation and causes problems for Ripley and the others at the end as they try to lure the alien into the lead works. Like Clive Mantle, you never see his character get killed off. Some of you Father Ted fans may remember him playing the recovering alcoholic, Henry Sellers. How dare they do this to me? How dare they sack me? I'm Henry Sellers! I'm Henry Sellers! The movie opens in space with a fire breaking out on the Soloco. A facehugger is on board and has caused the escape pod to be activated and leave the ship. Ripley and her companions crash land on Fury 161, two weeks after the events on LV-426. On impact, Hicks is killed, Newt drowns in her cryotube, Bishop and his remaining body parts are left scattered around the ship. Ripley is the only one to survive. Fury 161 is a foundry facility inhabited by male inmates with histories of physical and sexual violence. The inmates discover the escape pod and take Ripley and the remaining bodies back to base. As they transport the pod, one of the convict's dogs, called Spike, starts barking as he has seen the facehugger begin to emerge from the shadows. Ripley awakens in the infirmary and is told by the prison doctor Clemens that she is the sole survivor and the others didn't make it. She wants to check the escape pod to try and discover what caused the fire. She checks the pod and notices a burn on Newt's cryotube. She demands to see Newt's body and conduct an autopsy fearing that Newt has been impregnated with an alien embryo. Clemens is reluctant but performs it and they discover nothing but flooded lungs. The warden makes an appearance and warns Ripley that her presence may have disruptive effects on the prisoners and wants her to stay in the infirmary until the rescue team arrive. A funeral is held for Newt and Hicks and their bodies are cremated in the facility furnace. As the funeral is held, the dog Spike kills over and an alien bursts out of him. Ripley gets her head shaved and starts to form a friendship with Clemens and goes against the warden's advice and mingles with the prisoners, showing she is not intimidated by them. One of the convicts is cleaning an air shaft and believes he can see the dog's spike, but it's the alien and it spits acid in his face and he tumbles into the fan and is cut to shreds. The alien starts to increase in size rapidly and Golic sees the alien kill several members of the prisoners and runs in fear. At this point, Ripley reactivates Bishop, who confirms that an alien had been with them all the way. Golic is taken back to the infirmary and is blamed for the death of the other prisoners. Ripley overhears the warnings by Golic of the beast he saw. Ripley informs Andrews of her encounters with the aliens. Andrews does not believe her story and explains that the facility has no weapons. Their only hope is for the rescue team to arrive and Ripley is to be sent back to the infirmary. Ripley is starting to feel unwell and sick. Clemens gives her an injection to help her feel better but the alien takes him by surprise and grabs Clemens and kills him. The alien confronts Ripley but spares her and retreats taking Clemens' body. Ripley runs to the canteen to warn the others. Andrews orders Aaron to take her back to the infirmary, but he is ambushed and killed by the alien. Ripley explains to the inmates that she has never seen one like this before, but says these aliens are afraid of fire. They propose an idea to pour flammable toxic waste into the ventilation system and ignite it to flush out the beast. However, the plans go wrong as the alien kills one of the prisoners, setting off the explosion too early, which kills many of the inmates. Ripley is getting concerned about her health, so she, with Aaron's, helps scan herself using the escape pod's medical equipment and discovers the embryo of an alien queen growing inside her. In 2003, fans of the film finally got to see the assembly cut, or say the work print, of Alien 3, which was called the special edition for the DVD. It contains 37 minutes more footage, which included alternative scenes, extended dialogue, and whole sequences that were dropped from the theatrical cut. This version had been doing the rounds for years on bootleg VHS tapes, but finally we got to see the original cut cleaned up and presented in a way that was closer to David Fincher's vision. The special edition has several key plot elements that differ from the theatrical release. Ripley's unconscious body washes up on the shore of the planet instead of being found in the ship's wreckage as in the theatrical cut. The alien gestates in an ox rather than a dog and one of the inmates discovers a dead facehugger which is bigger than usual suggesting it can produce queen aliens. 
some scenes are extended to focus more on the religious views of the inmates. The prisoners and Ripley succeed in their attempts to trap the alien, but it is later released by Golic. There is a scene in the prisoners assembly hall in which one of the inmates suggests to Dylan that they lead the creature to the furnace so that they can incinerate it. For the finale, the queen alien does not burst from Ripley's chest as she falls into the furnace. I'm not sure why this was changed. The original footage in the theatrical cut that was shot looked very rushed and a bit crap. So with this new cut, I can only imagine it was done to run in continuity with Alien Resurrection, where they clone her 200 years later and the alien is removed from her chest or the possibility for the company to never see the alien, which they are so desperate to get hold of. I highly recommend getting the Blu-ray version, which has the improved ADR. The DVD version, some parts of the audio near the beginning was inaudible, so subtitles were provided, but for the Blu-ray they got the original actors to re-record their dialogue, which demonstrates Fox was spending good money on restoring this old work print, which I applaud. Boss Film and FX Supervisor Richard Edlund handled the Academy Award nominated visual effects for Alien 3. The film incorporates matte paintings, motion control, miniature shots, optical processing and puppets. The movie was made on the cusp of the CGI revolution. T2 was being shot at roughly the same time and made bigger efforts to take advantage of the technology. But Alien 3 did make use of computer animation for only a couple of shots. For example, the debris in the air, additional shadow added to the alien when it's on the ceiling and chasing after the convicts, and when the alien is sprayed with water and you see its head crack. The hardest effect to achieve was the alien and seeing it run down corridors or being attached to the ceiling. For the close-ups, it was Tom Woodruff in the suit, but for everything else, he was replaced with a rod puppet, filmed against blue screen and optically composited into the live action footage, and the rods controlling it were removed with rotoscoping. The rod puppet approach was chosen for the production rather than stop motion animation, which did not provide the required smoothness. As a result, the rod puppet allowed for a fast alien that could move across surfaces in a variety of angles. Lane Liska was hired to lead a team of puppeteers in a new process dubbed Mo Motion, where the rod puppet could be simultaneously manipulated depending on the complexity of the shot. The puppet was operated by four to six people. To make syncing the puppet's actions with the live action shots easier, the effects team developed an instant compositing system using Laserdisc. This made it easier to see what they recorded match the background plates and if any adjustments needed to be made. At the time I thought many of the effects looked a bit rubbish. I was surprised to learn later on the effects were nominated for an Academy Award. Watching it back in the early 90s on a pan and scan videotape didn't do the movie any favours, but even in high definition the opticals have really big chunky black matte lines. The shots of the alien on the ceiling look really bad. They don't blend well at all with the live action elements and only a few shots of the alien running actually look good and the majority look a bit hokey. I can fully sympathise with the effects team in their difficulty to visualise and bring to life the alien and making it run or do things with traditional optical processing and models. So I applaud them for their efforts but they were handicapped by the technology of the time. I think if Alien 3 arrived maybe two years later, then the alien would have been done in CGI, and I think it would have worked. When Ripley jumps into the furnace at the end, it's clearly rushed. This was all done in LA for the reshoots, and the compositing is terrible in the theatrical cut. It has this flicker to the image, maybe done to represent the heat, but it looks like it was composited on a VHS tape. The chest burster effect is perfectly fine, but then it cuts to a miniature falling in and there is no impact as she hits the fire. Very disappointing for the finale. The best stuff in my opinion is the motion control miniature at the beginning as you see the pod escape. The matte paintings are all stunning and all the work by Studio ADI is incredible as usual. But in all, I think Alien 3 is probably the most inconsistent quality of effects of the quadrilogy. The dodgy matte lines on the opticals may have been a result of the constant changes or the lack of time they had to complete the FX plates but I've seen a lot better from Boss Film. Elliot Goldenthal provides the score to Alien 3. Elliot had worked on a number of smaller movies prior to Alien 3, such as Pet Cemetery, but this was his first big budget blockbuster. Fincher loved Elliot's theatre work and experimental music. David felt it wasn't necessary to refer to the old themes of Alien and Aliens. He wanted the score to be its own separate entity. Fincher wanted there to be no hope for Ripley within the first five minutes into the movie. Elliot does throw in themes to remind us of domestic settings of Earth when we see Newt in the morgue and the big choral themes. 
Fincher didn't want Elliot to write recognisable orchestral themes, instead going for the music to create sound effects, which made it a tough job for the sound effects team and mixers to decide what to leave in, the music or the sound effects. It must have been a chore to edit, and Elliot did express his disappointment with the final mix, which he felt there was too much on-set production sound, instead of ADR, which gave the sound mix an inconsistent quality. I just love how the movie starts with the Fox logo, and the creepy threatening sound of the music kicks in. The opening theme really captures the essence of the score. The best piece of music which had the biggest impact on me was when Ripley sacrifices herself and jumps into the furnace. It's a heart-wrenching moment with the music building up to this epic emotional cue. It's some of Elliot's finest feature film work. Elliot Goldenthal was very proud of his music, highlighting in the Alien 3 documentary how you couldn't tell what was done electronically and by the orchestra. It's a perfect blend of both styles. I think the score is very effective, but it doesn't really lend itself to easy listening. One or two tracks do, but as a whole it's not something I can listen to as a separate piece. It works wonders with the film, which it's intended to do, and does its job splendidly, but as a film music lover it doesn't quite work for me in that regard. The soundtrack came out on CD at the time and isn't difficult to track down. With all the scores produced for the Alien series, it's certainly the most emotional one out of the bunch and stands on its own as a unique piece of music. Alien 3 had a number of video games released across the gaming platforms at the time. The first one to grab my attention and really got me interested in the Alien franchise was the Mega Drive release, which was also ported to the Amiga. It's your basic action platformer as you play as Ripley saving the convicts before they get impregnated by the facehuggers, and at the end of each level you fight against a big boss that spits acid at you. As the film only had one alien and no weapons, all the games released completely ignore that plot point and just take the film Aliens and give it that Alien 3 backdrop. For the Super Nintendo version they gave you more of the same but spice up the gameplay to give you more variety. You have missions to seal doors or replace equipment around the complex instead of just saving the convicts which you also have to do but the game feels less repetitive and is considerably longer than the Mega Drive release but suffers from having slower gameplay and can be more frustrating as you progress through the game. The jumping facehug has become really annoying from stage 2 onwards. Both the Mega Drive and SNES versions have their merits and can both be enjoyed. I think the SNES one offers more as a whole package, but the Mega Drive one is more intense, has faster gameplay and superior music. For the less powered consoles, a port was put on the Master System and Game Gear which for the time the graphics were very impressive and it retains the same gameplay. The Game Boy version had you play as Ripley from a top-down perspective, with a greater emphasis on exploration, acquiring items to beat limited puzzles and survival. The graphics were very simple and not very impressive, but had nice cutscenes between the levels. The NES version takes its cues from the Mega Drive game. It keeps it simple but makes changes to the graphics so it visually looks a lot different to the Sega ports. Finally we have Alien 3 The Gun, which was released exclusively for the arcade. You don't play as Ripley, it's basically an alternative plot to the movie. Two colonial marines are sent to the USS Sulaco to rescue survivors, only to crash land on Fury 161. They discover that the prison has been infested by thousands of aliens. You eventually kill the big boss alien, which is the one featured in the movie, then you face off against the guy who created Bishop. This arcade I only saw once in the wild during the mid-90s, and it looked amazing, and being a big Sega fanboy, I was so desperate to play it, but I didn't last long as it was bloody hard. I've only had a chance to play through it in more recent years thanks to emulation. It's a short game, it's designed to eat up your credits, but the presentation is slick and it offers something different than just another platform game. Alien 3 was the first movie of the series I saw growing up so I will always have this nostalgic connection to it, and it got me interested in the franchise. I was aware of its impact at the time and seeing the trailers on TV, and reading the articles covered in the magazines and the eventual backlash it got by the critics, so when I got to see it on VHS, I didn't get why it had received such hate. I was 11 or 12 at the time, so pfft, what do I know? But I had not seen the others prior to Alien 3's release, so I had no expectations. I wasn't concerned about the death of Hicks and Newt, I enjoyed it for what it was, but it certainly wasn't a perfect movie. It was depressing, it's hard to root for the characters when they are rapists and murderers, it was rarely uplifting, and Ripley sacrifices herself at the end, so it's not a feel-good movie. This was the intention of the filmmakers, however. This is a horror film that deals with serious adult themes, so with a negative tone to the movie, there is still an enjoyment factor to it. 
but it's not in the same vein as, say, Aliens, which has exciting action and heroics. The special edition version of Alien 3 is far better than the theatrical cut, and is the only version I watch. Since 2003, I haven't watched the theatrical cut and only watched it again recently for this review. The added scenes of dialogue in the new cut flesh out Charles Dance's character, and seeing Golic become obsessed with the alien was very much welcome. In the original cut, you never got a good sense of the geography of the locations, and saw little of the sets apart from the large key areas. In the assembly cut, you get to see more outside the complex, and see the loneliness of the character Clemens. You see the prisoners' quarters, and as a whole, the sequences flow together more coherently. But the new cut doesn't make Alien 3 suddenly a far superior movie. It's a better film all round, but I still have issues with it. It's not really a scary film, even with the added scenes. I never felt unnerved or tense while watching it. Alien 3 does have its fair share of gory scenes, but because it focuses more on the human aspect and their struggles, the sense of threat from the alien doesn't seem that obvious or impactful. As producer David Geiler said, it failed to deliver on its genre expectations, which I totally agree with. The new opening with the ox is a great scene, and the visual effect of the Bambi Burster standing up and running off is probably the best effect of the Mo motion technique, but the alien has no visual similarities to the ox. Oxes aren't known for their speed, which is a clear indication as to why they did the reshoots with the dog instead. The dog is more threatening and faster than the ox, but also the audience will sympathise more with the dog. Whenever you see a dog get hurt or die in a film, it tends to upset the viewer. The new alien seems to share visual traits to the dog, but even with this new direction, once the alien bursts out a spike, it's huge! You'd think the whole dog would have exploded. There are moments with the size of the alien often being inconsistent. Sometimes it looks huge throughout the movie, then considerably smaller in other scenes. With the assembly cut, it leaves in a bit of dialogue with the guy saying, is that you, Spike? But in this cut, we have never seen the dog, so if you hadn't seen the theatrical cut, you wouldn't know who he is talking about. Charles Dance's character Clemens is such a rich character, and hearing his heartbreaking story on how he became a prisoner is very moving. Then they literally kill him off a minute later, which I think was a bad move. You don't get rid of Charles Dance that early, you make the most of him. Having him survive to the big finale would have been great. Shortly after Clemens dies, the alien kills off the Warden, two of the best characters. I suppose it's done to take away the hierarchy quickly and instantly puts Ripley in charge, but by removing the most interesting characters, it always left me disappointed. But also in both cuts, you see characters just disappear by the end. You never see the alien kill them. I think with the large amount of prisoners, it became a nightmare to keep count of everyone and their final outcome. What has always left me puzzled and has never been explained is how the facehugger got on the Soloco. We see a quick shot of an alien egg tucked away in the corner during the opening credits. Now I'm sure many fans have their theories, but it just doesn't make sense with what we are told and what we've seen. The Queen at the end of Aliens hid inside the dropship and was sucked out the airlock by Ripley. She never had a chance to poop out an egg and shove it on the ship. The Soloco was in space the entire time and never went near the surface of LV-426, so how the hell did it get there? I don't know if Vincent Ward had a different idea on how the egg got on board the ship, but all the scripts seem to point to the egg already being on board. It's like they couldn't think of a legitimate reason or give a clear explanation to how it got there. Instead, they just went the lazy route. Despite the problems I've highlighted, I still return to the movie a lot. Just as much as the first two, it has a wonderful style and look to it. The production design is splendid, with a mix of what we've seen before with this industrial backdrop, but also a mix of early 20th century architecture with the morgue. With its grimy and grungy look, it still looks very appealing. The beauty of what makes Alien 3 so rewatchable for me is the dialogue. I think it has some of the best of the series despite its constant rewrites and fiddling by the studio. Everything between Ripley, Clemens and the Warden Andrews is brilliant. There is no sci-fi heavy jargon to their dialogue, it all seems down to earth and natural. With the large English cast and their constant swearing and flat out brutal dialogue, it feels like you are watching this BBC drama mixed with aliens, which may not be for everyone, but for me it really makes this movie stand out of the series. Under extreme pressure from the studio, Fincher really got some great performances out of the cast. Vincent Ward is credited for the story and the elements of what he came up with is still in the movie, only in its basic form. The structure of it is still there. It's a very much gutted version of Ward's script and just being butchered to fit Fincher's new vision and the studio's meddling. 
I love David Fincher as a director, he is phenomenal, but I still wish Vincent had got to make his version. I think the wooden planet idea is fascinating and the concept designs would have given us something unique and different. Even if Vincent gave in and went with the idea of the prisoners and removed the wooden planet concept, I still think he could have given us something compelling. Alien 3 needed a coherent vision and if the studio put faith in Vincent, it would have saved them plenty of money and avoided the drama that eventually took over the film. It's hard to know what Fincher's real vision was and what he didn't achieve. It may be down to the cuts that he felt his vision was screwed up, but it was never made clear on what he really wanted to do with it. There are visible elements that he introduced and the bleak nature of the film is very much his style, but it's not clear what he ultimately set out to do. I hope one day David discusses in more detail on what his vision was for the film. Maybe he will mellow with age, but at the moment he's still very bitter. Alien 3 certainly has its haters and I fully sympathise with them. Many were expecting a different movie and it failed to meet their expectations. But a film shouldn't necessarily be blamed because your expectations were something else or were set too high. If you followed the film during its early stages through film magazines and watched the making of, they do mention Hicks and Newt weren't returning, so you kind of know what to expect going in. David Fincher openly hates the film, so the haters aren't in a small minority, but fans of the film have certainly increased over the years, and it's often looked upon as an underrated movie, especially the longer cut. There is still a lot of good stuff in the film to make it a worthy entry into the series, the careless move to kill off Newt and Hicks so suddenly was a bad move, I must admit. I think Hicks and Newt could have had a role in the film. Hicks could have died later on in the film to bring a close to Ripley's and his relationship. And possibly Newt could have been the sole survivor instead of one of the prisoners. But I was well chuffed to see more survive, however. I didn't want to see him get killed off. If you put your expectations aside in terms of wanting a pure continuation of Aliens, then I think you'll find a decent movie that provides rich dialogue and visuals. It may not be that scary or deliver on what people wanted from the franchise per se, but if you see it as a separate piece, I think it very much works for the most part. Alien 3 is a prime example of lessons that should be learned. Don't announce a release date for a movie when nothing is ready. Have faith in a director and keep with one vision. Studios are always concerned about money and movies are made with the one goal of making profit. But if there is too many cooks in the kitchen wanting changes on a continuous basis, then you will pay for it, and then everything suffers because of spreadsheet decisions. Alien 3 in its special edition form I recommend if you haven't seen it. The DVD and Blu-ray come with a fantastic documentary that is three hours long, and is one of the best out there. When the DVD came out nearly 13 years ago, the documentary was the first thing I watched and it didn't disappoint. Alien 3 I can honestly say gets better with repeated viewing. There is always something you've missed that highlights its stronger elements, such as a line of dialogue or a visual that captures something that triggers an emotional response. It's an ultimately flawed film, but there is a substantial amount of good work in it to appreciate. David Fincher may hate the film, but that doesn't mean you have to, and I will continue to re-watch it in years to come. Ripley, last survivor of the Nostromo, signing off. There's a monster in your chest. These guys hijacked your ship and they sold your cryotube to this human and he put an alien inside of you. It's a really nasty one. And in a few hours, it's going to burst its way through your rib cage, and you're going to die. My mommy always said there were no monsters, no real ones, but there are. Welcome to the USN Obriga. Nice welcome, Perez. What the hell is this? Are you afraid the six of us are gonna hijack your damn ship or what? Elton, these were very, very hard to come by. So was our cargo. Wish you could understand what we're trying to do here. The potential for this species goes way beyond urban pacification. Now it's vaccines. Nothing like this we've ever seen on any world before. We should be very proud. Who are you? Ripley, Ellen, Lieutenant First Class. 
number 36706. Ellen Ripley died 200 years ago. You're not her. We used blood samples from Fiori 16 on ice where you died. We've remade you. We cloned you. It's a queen. How did you know that? She'll breed. You'll die. What the hell is going on here? He is conducting illegal experiments. He's breeding some I sort of... God, listen to me! Hold. He is breeding an alien species. It's too late. You can't stop it. It's inevitable. Not as long as I'm around. You'll never get out of here alive. Your attention, please. Non-human presence detected. Evacuation. I heard you, like, ran into these things before. That's right. What did you do? I died. Is that a goddamn trap? <laughs> Who are you? The 6th of November 1997, Alien Resurrection made its premiere in Paris, France and got its general release throughout the world on the 26th of November and into early 1998. Produced on a large budget of $75 million and directed by French director Jean-Pierre Jeunet. It made $161 million worldwide and proved very successful in France, Germany and the UK. Certainly not a failure, but didn't do as well as 20th Century Fox had hoped, especially in the USA. The review certainly didn't help its box office. Many critics were mixed on its qualities and the fans were disappointed with its story. US critics Siskel and Ebert even put it on their list of worst movies of 1997, but the movie was praised, however, for its unique visual design and production values. Alien 3 from 1992 left a bad taste in the mouths of critics and fans, and had a messy production with arguments between the director David Fincher and the studio 20th Century Fox. Despite its wealth of problems, it was a financial success, but with how the movie ended, there was no chance of Ellen Ripley coming back. Many felt this was the finale to the series, and it was time to move on. Sigourney Weaver did say it was sad to say goodbye to the character, to producer and writer David Guiler at its premiere, and he jokingly suggested they would probably clone Ripley to bring her back. Little did he know that would be the way to continue with a fourth entry in the series. 20th Century Fox knew the Alien series was profitable, and certainly wasn't going to let it disappear, and wanted to do a fourth one, and it needed to have Sigourney Weaver back in the lead role. They settled on hiring Joss Whedon, who at that point had written the Buffy the Vampire Slayer movie and contributed to Toy Story, but also had uncredited rewrites on The Getaway, Speed, The Quick and the Dead, Waterworld and Twister. Joss's brief on the studio was at the script to have the horrors of Alien, but the action of the sequel, and Sigourney Weaver must be in it, a task he found difficult and had to resort to cloning her to bring her back. Joss went through a number of drafts until the studio was happy. Producers Walter Hill and David Gala thought the script was rubbish and felt it would ruin the franchise, but they couldn't do anything as the studio had full control. Sigourney Weaver was shocked to learn they were doing a fourth movie, but read Joss's script and was impressed. She thought that the error during Ripley's cloning process would allow her to further explore the character, since Ripley became part human and part alien would create uncertainty about where her loyalties lay. But Sigourney doesn't come at a cheap price. She received an $11 million paycheck and a co-producer credit. Now Fox had to find a director. Every movie had one behind the camera with a strong visual eye and would bring something new to the table. But by Alien 3, it came clear to many that they wanted a director who would follow the rules and give them what they want and the director's creative freedom would be restricted. Director Danny Boyle was the producer's first choice to direct the film due to his success with train spotting. Boyle did show an interest and he and his producer met with the studio, but ultimately he decided against taking the project. French director Jean-Pierre Genet came to their attention due to his work on the city of Lost Children. The movie demonstrated his unique visual style and there was a great opportunity there for him to bring something new to the series. Jean-Pierre was shocked they asked him, but felt honoured. He wasn't interested in doing a sequel however, let alone a big Hollywood picture. He was working on his script for Emily and really wanted to focus on that. Fox did eventually manage to persuade him 
Jean-Pierre looked at the movie as a long commercial. He was being hired to help them make this movie. He wasn't going to have control over the script, but could contribute to it if it wasn't too costly, as a lot of the decisions had already been made. But he had the freedom to bring new ideas to the table and people he wanted to work with. Jean-Pierre hired French special effects supervisor Pitoff and cinematographer Darius Congi, both of whom he had worked with on The City of Lost Children. Genet and Darius watched the Alien movies and studied the lighting and camera setups. They managed to locate production notes from the first movie and discovered they had roughly 900 camera setups. Modern movies at the time had around 1600, so Pierre tried to match modern movie making when trying to compete with other movies with his own. Darius wanted to use the ENR process, which was adding silver to the chemical process of printing film. The result is a very contrasty and desaturated image, with particular rich blacks making shadows really dark. This process was used on Seven and Darius' previous movie, Evita. Apparently from reading a few sources online, Darius wasn't happy with the Blu-ray release of Resurrection because they didn't use the print with the added ENR. I believe earlier releases had the ENR added, such as the Laserdisc and DVD. The early releases had warmer skin tones, where the Blu-ray everyone looks a lot paler. Janae's frequent co-director Mark Caro had been asked as well to work on Alien Resurrection because he and Janot had directed The City of Lost Children. But Mark turned it down but did provide some rough sketches of the character's costumes. His designs were modified and expanded upon by veteran costume designer Bob Ringwood. Bob later admitted he was very pissed off when the Alien Resurrection making of book came out as it credited Mark as the costume designer and Bob wasn't mentioned at all. Instead of shooting in the UK at Pinewood Studios, they kept the production in the USA and filmed at the 20th Century Fox Studios in California. Shooting started in November of 1996 and ended in April of 1997. A cool piece of trivia, the scene where Ripley throws the basketball behind her was done for real. There is no digital trickery. The ball does go out of frame, which could make you think they manipulated the shot in the computer, but the raw outtakes prove that Sigourney Weaver has some skill. They had to cut quickly once it went in the basket, as Ron Perlman broke character to celebrate the achievement. The cast for Alien Resurrection is an interesting one, with Sigourney Weaver and Winona Ryder being the big stars, as everyone else is kind of relatively unknown to mainstream cinema. The movie doesn't quite have the acting talents of people like John Hurt, Ian Holm and Charles Dance. With a new cast of characters, we have Winona Ryder, apparently cast very early on into the production, plays Anna Lee Cool, the newest crew member of the Betty. She recognises Ripley and has knowledge of the aliens. Cool is later revealed as a synthetic built by other synthetics. Winona was cast to appeal to younger audiences, but at that point her career wasn't really on the up. If, say, she was cast in Alien 3 for a part, it would have seemed like the right move as her popularity had hit a high in the early 90s. Michael Wincott, I'm sure everyone remembers from films such as Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, and The Crow plays Frank, the captain of the mercenary ship, The Betty. Ron Perlman plays Jonah, a mercenary and member of the Betty's crew. Jonah is very short-tempered and appears to only think about himself and his well-being. Ron had just starred in The City of Lost Children, and at this point in his career was mainly getting parts in TV in the USA. And after Resurrection, his career in film was on the up, and he has been working extensively since, and jumped into the comic book world to play Hellboy. Dan Hadea plays General Martin Perez. Perez is the commanding officer of the Origa and supervises the experiments to clone Ripley and study the aliens. Dan has maintained a healthy career in film and TV, and for fans of 80s action movies, he was the villain in Commando. Also has the hairiest arms and shoulders on film I've ever seen. J.E. Freeman, who sadly passed away in 2014, plays Dr. Mason Wren. Wren is one of the several scientists aboard the Auriga, involved in cloning Ripley and studying the aliens. After the aliens escape, he joins the crew of the Betty in their attempt to flee the ship. He very much operates in the interests of the military and can't be trusted. Dominic Pignon plays John the Betty's mechanic. His character is a paraplegic and makes use of a motorised wheelchair. Dominic has worked with Pierre on many of his films and before Resurrection he was in Delicatessen and The City of Lost Children. Dominic didn't really move into English language films despite speaking very good English and continued with his career in French cinema. Talented character actor Brad Dorf plays Jonathan Gediman, another one of the scientists involved in cloning Ripley. He becomes one of the first to be taken to the alien hive for feeding. Brad's had a varied career in film and TV and has been in a number of movies such as Dune, Exorcist 3, and he is the voice of Chucky. Raymond Cruz plays Vincent De Stefano, a soldier aboard the Aurigai. When the aliens break out, he joins the crew in their attempts to escape from the ship. Before starring in Resurrection, he was in Under Siege and Clearing Present Danger, and still works steadily today. Gary Dordan plays Christy, the first mate and second in command of the Betty. He stores pistols hidden under his sleeve so he can draw his weapons quickly. And Gary went on to have a successful career in TV, and starred in the show CSI for eight years. Kim Flowers, a former ballet dancer, plays Hillard, the assistant pilot of the Betty who is romantically involved with the Captain Frank. 
Her career came to a halt come 1998 and hasn't acted since. Finally, we have Leland Orser as Larry Purvis. Purvis is one of the several humans who have been kidnapped by the crew of the Betty while in cryosleep and delivered to the Auriga to serve as hosts for the aliens. He has an alien inside him, which luckily for him appears to be growing slowly, so he decides to flee the ship with the crew from the Betty. The movie is set 200 years after the events on the planet Fury 161 where Ripley died. A group of scientists are operating on behalf of the military and they have finally completed the cloning process of Ellen Ripley. This has been their eighth attempt. Once cloned in full adult form, they extract the Queen Xenomorph and keep Ripley alive for further study as her DNA is now mixed with the alien, giving her unique abilities such as super strength, acid for blood and a psychic link to the aliens. A group of mercenaries arrive at the science space station on their ship, the Betty. They deliver several kidnapped humans in stasis, and the military scientists intend to use the humans as hosts for the aliens, raising several adult aliens for study. Ripley warns them that the aliens can't be trained to do their bidding, but the scientists stress the aliens can help further improve medicines and their technology. The Betty crew soon encounters Ripley as they have decided to stay for a few days. Cole recognises Ripley and manages to break into her quarters and tries to kill her, suspecting she may be used to create xenomorphs, but is unaware the creatures have already been born. She tells Ripley she died 200 years ago and she is not the real Ripley, but a clone. Cole leaves but is caught by security. Meanwhile, the xenomorphs have quickly matured and are learning fast and manage to escape by killing one of their own. The acidic blood burns through the floor and they escape. Dr. Gediman goes into their enclosure and sees the damage and is quickly grabbed and taken to the hive where the queen is starting to produce more eggs. Due to Call's actions, the security team have decided to kill the mercenaries as they can't have the information of their experiments being leaked to the powers that be on Earth. Frank and his team spring a surprise attack and take hostages as they want to return to the Betty. They are alerted by a security breach as the aliens have begun to attack. The aliens have come for Ripley but she breaks free in time. Frank gets distracted and is left on his own and is quickly taken out by an alien and his crew discover his remains. Ripley turns up and joins the team but Cole says Ripley can't be trusted, claiming she is one of them. The space station has started moving due to the emergency and is returning to Earth which they need to stop before the xenomorphs can make their way to the planet and escape. Alien Resurrection makes use of a wide variety of visual effects and for the first time makes use of CGI to a large extent, with audiences now seeing aliens do things we never saw them do before. Studio ADI, who had worked on Alien 3, were brought back to develop the makeup and creature effects and also designed the new alien called the Newborn. The 90s saw a big change in visual effects and computer-generated material was becoming more apparent in movies as technology was improving each year. Alien 3 had a small amount of CG, but the fourth movie would realise the aliens in CGI form for the most complicated shots. The digital effects were handled by Blue Sky Studios, VIFX and Pitoff's company based in France. Alien 3 had used Bost Film, but for the new movie the studio decided not to use the big FX companies such as ILM and Digital Domain. They went with a number of smaller companies who had expertise in different areas, which helped the production save money. Blue Sky Studios were hired because of their work on the film Joe's Apartment, where they created CGI cockroaches. On Resurrection, they created around 20 shots of CGI aliens. Blue Sky were well known in the industry for their expertise in ray tracing, which is a rendering technique for generating an image by tracing the path of light as pixels in an image plane and simulating the effects of its encounters with virtual objects, essentially clever lighting techniques that creates a very high degree of visual realism. A big chunk of their work is featured in the underwater sequence, which is an effect that hadn't been done before in computer animation. Jeannot asked ADI to lean towards making the new human slash alien hybrid creature more human than a xenomorph. An early idea was to replicate Sigourney Weaver's features, but Alec Gillis felt combining a hideous monster with a beautiful woman's face had already been done with Species from 1995. Jean-Pierre was impressed with a design by Chris Cunningham. He had designed his own hybrid, which looks very 2000 AD, and they loosely followed that design. Jeannot wanted the creature to look sympathetic, it had to have human characteristics and that came with its eyes and the sounds it makes and generally how it moved. Basically it was this horrible toddler. It was puppeteered by nine operators and certainly the most complicated animatronic creature that ADI had designed. The new hybrid alien did have genitalia which resembled a mix of male and female sexes but 20th Century Fox were uncomfortable with this and even the director felt it was a bit too much. So they had to fork out a lot of money to hide the genitalia with digital effects. 
All of the spaceships in the film were miniatures, as visual effects supervisors believed CGI was not effective enough to create realistic spaceships. It was a challenge to light the miniatures with the added silver in the ENR process, so you have to experiment to get the best lighting methods without giving away the miniatures scale, so it took a number of tests to get the best results. I recall at the time people were unimpressed with the CG work. It was a big step to move from puppet work to CGI. For the FX guys involved, I'm sure it was a challenge and they probably knew fans may react negatively. I think in some parts the aliens don't look decent. I think with them climbing up the ladder and avoiding the bullets and walking down the corridor, it doesn't quite work. It all looks too shiny. The underwater work I think is brilliant however, when you see it explode it's very polished in its realism. A common trait of 90s CG work is that they overdid it with compositing. Having so many elements applied to a shot and the digital resolution can't match film and even optical work. It certainly gets rid of the black lines and grading issues but lacks the resolution. When you look at the CG work from that decade you can often tell it's that 90s look for computer animation. Studio ADI I think provides some of their best work. They are such experts when it comes to aliens and gory effects. You can always trust them to deliver. Seeing the entrance to the Queen's Hive is pretty impressive and nothing we'd seen before. The film plays up the slight sexual nature of it all. I suppose it was like seeing an HR Giga painting in motion. However, I do think the aliens in the film are a bit too dribbly. I think they overdid it with the KY jelly. Designing a brand new alien is a tough challenge and I think they created something interesting but ultimately flawed. Because of its size, there isn't much movement. Its arms are too long and makes it look puppeteered than having any natural movement. It has to be covered in a creative way, which is what they attempt to do. I think all the efforts are put into its face and it's a pretty nasty monster. Its eyes look very real and the childish noise it makes is unsettling, but I think the design wasn't received well by the fans on the whole. Its yellowish skin makes it look like it's made out of chicken korma. I don't ever recall seeing many people wanting to buy a statue or figure of this new monster. To be honest, I don't ever think I ever saw one on sale. The visual effects and makeup work is certainly a huge step up from Alien 3. That movie was inconsistent with its visuals and Resurrection is certainly more polished on the whole. With it being that cross point from practical to CG, you often see those transitions don't work as well. You can easily tell what's practical and what is computer generated, but they were certainly very ambitious and doing things that hadn't been done before. So in all the effects have stood up well over time despite my issues with a number of shots. John Frizzle composed a score to Alien Resurrection. This was one of his early scores and he had just recently worked on Beavis and Butthead Do America and Dante's Peak. And since working on Alien 4 he has gone on to produce many scores for horror movies. John had heard the fourth movie was in production and sent in four cassette tapes to audition for the position of composer. By chance the director listened to the music and was impressed and a meeting was arranged between John Pierre and John and he was hired. John Frizzle spent seven months writing and recording the score which Jeno requested to be very different and unique from the previous films in the series, but there are cues that reference to previous scores, as they throw in the hypersleep track from the first movie that pops up near the beginning and when Ripley returns to the Betty. The score included themes of romance and eroticism and creates a new theme for Ripley in her cloned form. I think once they get to Earth, John Frizzle really gives it its all with the finale, delivering it with a big harmony. Elliot Goldenthal used a similar method to end Alien 3. The score to Resurrection is certainly very interesting, it's atmospheric and melodic, it certainly serves the movie well and complements its visuals and tone. It doesn't quite have the memorable themes of the other three however, the composer said he wasn't very literal with highlighting the themes, each score of the series is very different from the other. Alien is this lush sci-fi score that has really eerie sounds, Aliens has the military driven score with bombastic action cues and number three has this industrial experimental approach with modern orchestral harmonies. Resurrection like the others offers something new but I don't think it's quite as memorable for me. It's surprising they went with a younger composer who didn't have that many scores under his belt. They could have easily picked someone like James Newton Howard or Basil Podoris but then again it's good to see studios give younger people opportunities to prove themselves and further their career. The score got its release on CD in 1997 with 45 minutes of music and was given an expanded release in 2010 by La La Land Records and issued with a two CD set which contained unreleased music and the original album. Sadly this two disc set is sold out and the original album is not available for streaming so if you want to add it to your collection you will have to hunt down a copy from a private seller. 
Now, for anyone who owned the VHS of Alien Resurrection, you may remember an advert for an upcoming video game that was announced for the PlayStation and PC, but it never came out when intended. The game was originally developed by Fox Interactive as a third-person survival horror game, very much like Resident Evil, but the game was eventually scrapped and was started again from scratch, which is surprising considering the movie didn't do that well, and the window to profit on any tie-in had essentially been closed. Argonaut Studios were hired to produce a first-person shooter that would be exclusively developed for the PlayStation. The game was eventually released in late 2000. It consists of 10 levels, the first 9 taking place at the Auriga space station, and the last level aboard the Betty. The player uses 4 different characters from the movie, you play as Ripley for the majority of the game, while Carl, DiStefano and Christy each get their own level. The game didn't go down too well with video game critics at the time, many complaining that it was too difficult, but most pointed out its frustrating controls. The programmers decided to make use of the analogue controls for the PlayStation Joypad to move and look around, which is now the common method of playing first-person shooters. The game wasn't the first to include this option, however. Medal of Honor was the first to do that, but this game was the first to make them the default controls. You only need to browse the old GameSpot review, which spent the majority of its critique bashing the controls. So I think it was unfairly judged, and it was doing something new. It helped influence the genre of first-person shooters for games consoles. Due to its poor sales and late timing, ports to the PC and Dreamcast were cancelled. I think the graphics for the time and coming from a PlayStation, they looked pretty good. So I definitely think it's worth your time to play it, and it's certainly not as bad as critics made it out to be. First thing I would like to say is that I don't hate Alien Resurrection. I don't think it's a bad movie or a really good one, but just a well-made film that has unfortunately a very mediocre script. It does have some interesting ideas, but fundamentally the story doesn't really go anywhere. Now going back to early 1998 when I saw the film when it hit VHS, I made an effort to hunt down a widescreen VHS tape. At that point, more widescreen versions of movies were starting to become more readily available, and I didn't own a Laserdisc player at that point, so I did watch it how it was intended to be seen. First impressions back then was that it looked really good. The photography and its visual effects seemed, to me, very polished. I do think its visual style may not be for everyone, however. Its very earthy colours, such as the browns and yellows, may not be the best colour palette for the Alien series. But it was doing something different and unique, which each Alien film always seemed to do. If you are familiar with Jean's previous movie, The City of Lost Children, there is a familiar design in its lighting, but does feel slightly watered down for his Hollywood outing. What is very apparent is its super stylized direction and camera work, making it feel less like the other movies. Aliens 1 to 3 had this gritty style to them, and often felt like a documentary. Resurrection had these over the top camera moves as it zooms towards the actor, or we see the camera dive down Larry's throat and into his chest. It was a bit too much and a departure from what went before. It felt like an attempt to appease younger audiences. You could say coming across as more of a comic book movie. The cast of characters are somewhat bland. I don't think anyone gives a bad performance per se, but no one really is given a chance to shine or have any interesting dialogue, thus making the majority of them forgettable. Ron Perlman is gold in everything he's in. He is certainly my favourite character as his shitty attitude to everyone brings out quite a lot of humour. I think he does his best to elevate the dialogue and when he sees that spider and shoots it, it's definitely one of my favourite scenes. I hate spiders, so if I was in that situation, I would certainly do the same thing. It's clear they're trying to capture the team of aliens, but the scenes and dialogue just don't give them much to do. Dominique does a fine job with his part, and I was very happy to see him survive at the end. I think he and Ron are certainly the best of the new characters. Ripley I felt less attached to in this one. Her character is all over the place. When we are introduced to her, she is distant and not the same person we knew. She is gradually getting her memories back and her personality is returning. But she acts weird, as you might expect with the mixed DNA from the alien. She acts like the alien is the enemy to her, then she returns to the hive and is introduced to the newborn, then attempts to escape, and when she bumps into the crew, she acts like classic Ripley, we all know and love. There is this uneven tone to her performance that makes it unclear how much she is connected to the aliens and how much of her original personality has returned. There are some really good moments with Sigourney. I think she is a superb actor and great in everything she's in. Her best moment is when she sees all the clones and you can see her heart break when she sees version 7 who is all twisted up and in pain and wants to be killed. Sigourney's emotions seem very real, it's disturbing and upsetting at the same time. Winona is okay in the part but her character is just there to serve the plot and she seems more of an irritant than someone we really want to get invested in. I want to know more about these synthetics and how she joined the mercenaries. I think more opportunities could have been made to make us feel invested in this new set of characters. Frank, for example, gets killed off very early on. I think Wincott did a good job of his performance and is just wasted. The script shortchanges potentially interesting characters for bland ones. 
I feel setting it 200 years later was a mistake. The Whalen Utani Company is no longer around and has been replaced with this military operation and their science division. We aren't given much information about them and they don't really seem a threat to Ripley. In Alien and especially Alien 3, the company was this evil corporation who wanted the Xenomorph as a weapon. So Ripley was battling the aliens and the corporate people of Earth wanting to profit from this monster. The date of the year in Alien 3 for example didn't feel like they couldn't take advantage of cloning, you get the impression their technology was more than capable. Resurrection is certainly the goriest out of the series and is not the one to watch while eating your dinner, which I often like to say when something is a bit too graphic. The death of many of the characters featured throughout they don't hide away from those bloody scenes. The death of the new alien is really disturbing, I think. Seeing it get sucked out of a tiny hole into space and you see all its innards fall out and it's crying like a baby. Not comfortable viewing, which is their intent, but a bit too much for me. I think there's a certain level of nastiness in this film. I think the others in the series often cut away at a certain point and were a bit more creative in how they showed you those horrifying moments. It's clear they have chosen to be more graphic to compete with modern horror. The Alien franchise to me wasn't just about being bloody and gory. It was about what was lurking in the shadows and the sense of being isolated. They never showed you too much of the Alien and were creative in what they did show you due to the limitations of someone in a costume. But that actually worked in its favour, and now seeing these aliens swimming around and seeing them, for example, planning an escape felt so odd to me. It was like they were giving them too much character. Jean-Pierre was a gun for hire. He did what the studio wanted, but they gave him creative freedom with the designs and the look of the film. And in retrospect, he is very happy with what he did on the film. Even H.R. Giger was pleased with the results. If you watch a big documentary that came with the DVD and Blu-rays, many felt the script was good and the production was relatively stress-free, but also some felt it didn't really bring anything new, and overall it just looked really nice. I think the studio had learnt their lessons on Alien 3, and they had a director who was willing to please them and kept everything on schedule and avoided any drama, but ultimately it's a very safe movie for the studio, and you get that impression. I look upon Alien Resurrection as a great continuation in the technical achievements we've come to expect from the Alien series. There's always something interesting brought forward with the visual styles and the overall cosmetic designs that make each one different from the other. It demonstrated at that point the studio didn't want to take the risk of not continuing the series without Sigourney Weaver. Having her return through the basis of cloning does undermine her departure at the end of Alien 3. The third film is messy and uneven, but when she sacrifices herself the emotions are there and her story arc had finished. It's always risky moving forward without the lead, but I think they should have gone a different direction and cast a new character to battle the aliens. They paid a lot to get Sigourney Weaver to return, but end up putting her in a movie that seems to tick all the boxes the studio wanted in that spreadsheet decision sort of a way to avoid any risks. But you end up down familiar territory and the film ends up with a very underwhelming ending. She finally gets to Earth and we don't see it. Well, in the special edition you get to see Paris all destroyed. In the theatrical cut they mention Earth being a shithole, but when they arrive it seems alright. Well, from a distance anyway. But you realise in the extended cut what they were referring to. You just need Bruce Campbell to turn up saying, I slept too long! They could have at least landed there and the new alien begins to attack and they finally manage to kill it. Just something extra than just being another face off with aliens on a spaceship. A change of location was certainly needed. Resurrection is the furthest they got with the timeline and now everything has gone back before Alien with Prometheus and Covenant, very much like Star Trek is doing now. Resurrection displayed they clearly run out of ideas once they brought Ripley back. Covenant yet again showed us they are repeating themselves with familiar setups and scares. That's the unfortunate problem with doing sequels, things get very samey. I think many fans of sci-fi and the Alien series in general have seen this movie and I think most look upon it unfavourably, which is understandable. If I were to watch this or the Alien vs Predator sequels, I would certainly watch Resurrection, but despite its superior effects and clear narrative, I still think it's weaker than Alien 3, thus making it the weakest of the Sigourney Weaver series. Resurrection is not a huge dud or a mistake, it's just an average movie and that's its biggest crime. I expect better from the series and its ending just leaves a bad taste in your mouth. Hopefully one day someone will come up with a great idea to give new life to the series and we see a continuation on from Alien Resurrection. If you enjoyed the video don't forget to hit the like button and click the bell to be notified of my latest retrospectives and reviews. Big thanks to my patrons for supporting the channel. If you want to get involved and gain early access to my content and exclusive videos then follow the link below.